Hayden. Hayden, what are you doing over there? Hayden. 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 We're going to get started. <clears throat> Gentlemen. All right, let's get started. If you will please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Okay. At this time, I would like to call the meeting to order. Individuals wishing to address the City Council are requested to complete a speaker card and deliver the card to the City Clerk staff prior to the item being heard by the City Council. Please observe a three-minute limit for communications, and once called upon to speak, we request that you state your name and City of Residence for the record. <clears throat> Moving on to communications from the public. This portion of the agenda is intended for general public comment, only on items within the Council's jurisdiction that are not listed elsewhere on the agenda. Please note that the state law prohibits the City Council from discussing or, make, or taking action on these items. Please observe a three-minute limit for communications, and once called upon to speak, we request that you state your name and City of Residence for the record. Ms. Edwards, are there any speaker cards or written comments for communication from the public? Mayor, we did not receive any speaker cards or in comments. Okay, then let's jump into the agenda. Um, before we do so, just want to make note that we are moving item number two um, to the end. So discussion on the upcoming downtown revitalization will be the last item we speak on today. Let's start with item number one, housing element update 2021 through 2029, draft document and housing sites inventory. And we have Ms. Joanne Coletta, community development director, who's going to provide the report. Sound like it's there we go. Thank you. <laughs> I can usually hear my voice. <laughs> so, um, yes, I want to give the City Council an update on where we are at with our housing element update. This presentation was also given to the Planning Commission this week, so we're just bringing the City Council up to speed. So going over the timeline, if you recall, we started this back in the first part of the year. In January, we had a joint City Council and Planning and Housing Commission study session. At that time, we went over what the housing element was, what it covered, and how it aligns with that regional housing needs assessment process, which we call RENA. And I believe we discussed that a lot in the very first part of the year, so there's no need to re-educate the council on what that is. I think you are all experts now, by the way, which is really good. <laughs> on January 25th, uh, we did release the online housing survey. We were really looking for feedback from the public on really when it comes to choices in housing and where housing should be located. In February, we had stakeholder workshops. This is with our special interest groups. These are groups that specialize with uh, people of special needs in order to provide accommodations for housing. This could be uh, persons of disabilities, they could be senior citizens, they can be females of domestic violence, and they can also be uh, low-income families. We then on March 17th had our city council public meeting on the RENA process and the impl implications for not having a compliant housing element. 
In May, we did a community meeting. We wanted to invite the public out to learn about the housing element, what it means, and if they had any questions. Then as of last week on June 17th, we did post the housing element update draft. It is now available on our website and that public review is for a period of 60 days. We are asking for the public to review it as well as our special interest groups to provide feedback. So when we come back to the planning commission, hopefully in September, we've addressed all some of the public comments and we're able to move forward. And then today is just to give you that update as well. So some of the public outreach information, we do have a website completely devoted to the housing element update. Anytime there's new information posted or there's a meeting, we push it out on our Facebook page and any of our social media platforms. We also have a special interest contact list, which has about 74 agencies and organizations. 100 letters were also mailed to property owners that have been identified on our housing sites inventory. We also posted an interactive mapping tool called Map Social on our website. So it allows people to uh, sign in and look at the housing sites inventory and actually give a thumbs up or a thumbs down or provide any comments. And then there's also an email established strictly for the housing element update that they can send comments or questions to. So where are we at today? As I indicated, the draft is now available for review. We are at the beginning of the 60-day review period. We are getting ready in the next week or two to also have conversations with HCD and submit our draft document. They, too, also have a 60-day review period. We are also disclosing our housing sites inventory. That inventory will also be looked at by HCD for comment, and this shows how we are aligning our arena with the SCAG allocation. And then again, we're looking for any public feedback during this time. So when you view the housing element, these are the chapters that are primarily covered in it. We talk about our housing needs assessment. These are existing and projected housing needs. We talk about the housing constraints, whether they're related to the market, whether they're related to governmental constraints, infrastructure, or environmental. The housing resources is where we talk about our arena allocation as well as our residential sites inventory and where we are going to be planning um, the housing that we've been asked to plan for in this arena allocation. The document will also discuss some of our successes as well as our past accomplishments under our housing plan, which is under the current fifth cycle. And then the final chapter is our housing plan for the upcoming sixth cycle and what we will need to do within that eight year planning period. This again is just a recap of our arena number. We had an allocation of 6,088 units and those were broken down into several income categories from very low, low, moderate, and above moderate. I do want to make mention that our largest allocation was given in the very low and low income category, about 2,800 units. So that was a rather substantial um, allocation there. And it really plays a part when it comes into identifying sites just because of the restrictions associated with that. I'm just providing this information as FYI. This just gives you what the income categories are for these uh, low and moderate income categories. Um, from one person to five person, it just gives you a general idea of what someone is making when they're in these income categories and how much they would have to have in order to afford housing. So the criteria that we use to identify housing sites, um, we counted existing residential projects that may have been approved but have not yet been built. And we were also able to look at reg residential projects that have been planned but not yet entitled. And what that means is that we may have some uh, proposals into city staff, but they have not yet surfaced at the public uh, review stage because we're still working with them on that. So it does give us an idea of what's forthcoming. We also looked at our existing zoning and general plan to identify sites for the moderate and above moderate income category. Uh, those can be vacant properties as well as non-vacant properties. And when I talk about non-vacant properties, I'm talking about those properties that maybe are large enough to accommodate additional dwelling units because of their size and they can possibly be rezoned to a medium density category to qualify as a moderate income site. We also used HCD's guidebook when it comes to accommodating the low-income arena. 
In order for us to demonstrate that we have appropriately planned for low income housing sites, we have to have a density of 30 dwellings to the acre or more. Anything less than that does not get counted towards low density housing sites. So we have to demonstrate to HCD that we have enough sites available for that planning period. We also used our housing survey results that we got back from the public. And then we also selected non-vacant sites uh, that included one of the following in our commercial centers. Maybe they had less than 50% building coverage. Maybe those sites are underutilized. Or maybe they have some vacancies or high turnover. Just in the HCD guidebook, um, one of the things that they want jurisdictions to look at when they're citing the lower income arena, they really want jurisdictions to take a look at proximity to transit, as well as proximity to high performing schools and jobs, parks and services, healthcare facilities and grocery stores. If there's available infrastructure and utilities in those locations, HCD does not want a jurisdiction to look at a piece of vacant land that may not have available infrastructure, which would mean that it's really not a palatable site because of all the infrastructure that would need to come in place. So usually infill becomes the most viable option because infrastructure already exists. Um, with the housing element update, we are not required to have all of our housing sites inventory that require rezoning to be rezoned this year. HCD gives us up to three years to do that. So what that means, it's part of our housing plan, and we would go and come back to the Planning Commission, the City Council, with a more comprehensive rezone program that gives us more time to evaluate development standards and anything else that we want to put into the program, but it does not need to be done at the time the housing element is updated we just have to identify the site so that is something that we will work on after the housing element is adopted the online housing survey was open for 35 days there were 12 questions and we got 260 responses um, I just want to go over two questions that were uh, talked about in the survey. However, all of the answers to the housing survey are available online, and they are also Appendix A of the housing element draft, so you can actually see all the questions and the responses. But one thing we did ask the public is, where do you think housing should be located? And we also asked, which areas of the city do you think higher density residential should be located when it involves apartments or condominiums? So the survey response, when we asked them, where do you think housing should be located, the majority of the response said throughout the city. That was almost 48%. And then the second largest response was within areas uh, within walking distance to public transportation. But when I go to the next question, when we ask the public, where do you think uh, the city would be better suited for higher density residential that involves apartments or condominiums, the majority of the response at 75% said in areas within public transportation walking distance. And then the second largest was in areas near commercial centers. So you can see there's a big shift there when it comes to just general residential development. It should be spread throughout, but then when you specifically target higher density development, it was really isolated to the specific area. This is just uh, information that comes from WRCOG. Uh, in looking at our proximity to transit, this is where we really needed to focus. We know that we have a good public transportation corridor along 6th Street, that is our regional bus route, and then we also have the Metrolink station with um, Metrolink located along North Main Street. And we also have some existing TOD in that area. What the shades indicate is actually the distance to public transportation and the walking distance time. So the darker purple shows you that you are within five minutes or a quarter of a mile of public transportation. And then as you go lighter, it's about a 10 minute uh, walking distance. And then the lightest is about 15. And this extends all the way to the east end as well. We also looked at the proximity to food outlets and other services, same thing. The shaded colors represent the five, 10, and 15 minute walking distance. And that is for the east side as well. So you can see it starts to break up. So where do we need to meet our arena shortfall? So what we need to do here, we actually work backwards. So we have that allocation of 6,088 units. We looked at our planned and approved units and we were able to subtract that. We also get to anticipate the number of accessory dwelling units that we expect to occur over the next eight year period. HCD allows us to use a three year trend. 
So in doing so, we get to come up with the number and apply that to our arena allocation as part of the planning process. So when we did that, we needed to really plan for the remaining 3,726 dwelling units. So we looked at vacant units already zoned, and we also looked at non-vacant units already zoned. And then what was left from there is where we needed to start focusing on potential rezoning. So the end result there was just over 2,600 of low-income units and about 650 units of moderate-income units. So that's where the rezoning program is going to focus. HCD does recommend that jurisdictions have a 20% buffer from their allocation. I can tell you that is a very difficult and challenging thing for us. Right now, for a lower income, I'm only at 9.5%. It's about the best I can do right now. Doesn't mean that it won't change throughout this process. We may get more. The reason why they recommend that is because we have this no net loss rule. So if you start to uh, plan development that may take up one of these sites, HCD immediately wants you to put it back because I always have to maintain that number during the eight year period. So it means in the future, if we don't have that buffer, we're gonna be chasing sites in order to make up that loss. So we never know what happens, but I just right now I'm at that nine and a half percent. We needed to get moving forward on this and um, present it to HCD, but it does not prevent us from getting certification. It's just a recommendation. So I'm just gonna go over quickly the housing sites inventory. Again, all of this is available on site, so you will definitely have more time to look at that. One of the things that HCD allows a jurisdiction to do is come up with an affordable housing overlay zone. This is actually a zoning tool, and I found it to be very beneficial. So when you're dealing with properties that are already developed, they already have existing zoning. The overlay will not affect the current zoning of a property or what it's currently being used for. So basically, you, when you establish this overlay, if a property owner in the future decides, you know what, I want to enact this and I want to do affordable housing, this zoning would come into play at that time. So it's a, it's a zoning mechanism that we will already have in place for someone in the future. The caveat is, is that it does have to have affordable housing. HCD's minimum threshold is 20%. Do I know if the city is going to be at 20%? We may need to be a little bit higher, but that's discussion we can have after the fact when the housing element is approved. Um, because we have such a high allocation of low and very low income units, we may need to be at 30%. I don't know. That is something that we will need to continue to look at. But it does have to have an affordable housing component in order to utilize this overlay zone. You just don't get to use it for uh, regular market rate housing. It can be mixed use, but again, affordable housing is the key there. Uh, rezone sites to meet the arena shortfall. These are those that we can go in and actually do a rezone from maybe an R1 to an R2. Uh, we don't have a lot of that going on, but um, there are a few sites that we looked at that um, could be increased in density, so we are proposing those as well. Um, some of these lots are large enough to accommodate additional dwelling units, so we're proposing medium density. We also had a church uh, reach out to us in the very beginning. As you know, there are some churches that have you know land that they never develop on, and they are looking to provide some kind of housing opportunity for the people that they serve, so that is also uh, what we looked at, and that is also something that HCD encourages as well. And this is just an example of some non-vacant sites that are already zoned. We don't have to do anything with them. Um, they're either vacant or they have the opportunity to add additional dwelling units based on their current zoning as well as their current general plan designation. So those are what's identified there. This is just uh, information on, on the housing element and how you can contact and receive the information, and I can answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Coletta. Let's go to my colleagues for any questions. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Um, I just had a couple of questions. First on the, the rezoning time, so it's you said uh, three years, is that correct? Now, <clears throat> the sites that we identify, we are stuck with those, correct? Unless we find something else to trade off until a later date, is that correct? Okay. Um, and then I, I saw in the ADU numbers seem very low, and I know that's based on on what we're currently seeing. Um, even though the ADU, the the new ADU laws, they keep evolving, and and they've gotten certainly more um, I don't know, easily done. I think in the past year, 
Is there any indication that um, HDD is going to allow you to factor that you're going to see more, um, more of that, more more ADUs, and or is it just a, that that three year average, or has there been any discussion about that? So there there. They are. They have been cautious. If they see jurisdictions are trying to overinflate their ADU to say that they've accommodated their arena, that's what their concern is. So we do the annual reporting every year, as you know, in April, and we do list the ADUs that we have permitted. So we will continue to demonstrate how much ADU we have in the planning process through that annual reporting. But um, yeah, we have taken really, we had a really good trend just this last year. And it's just because of the momentum sure. and the um, publicity on ADUs in the last year. And it seems like it's getting you know easier and you're starting to see that there's builders that are specializing in doing that. And I mean, seeing advertising for specifically how to, this is the easiest way to build an ADU. And I just, I see that market you know growing and I'm glad to see that we're able to count them. I was just hoping to see if, that there would be more. And then um, my last is uh, with, you know, we have a, a slew of housing bills that are going to be voted on over the next, you know, well, one yesterday. And uh, so other one's going to be finally voted on and then uh, whether or not they get approved by the governor. But that's going to be done in the next couple of months. And SB9 uh, and SB10, they have a, will have a massive change on, on these. How, what happens that we've gone through this process and those two, at least those two or other ones, come along and 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 tweak how people can look at their property. I mean, how do we how do we adjust or can we adjust our, um, our the housing element based on on those potential rules? So, if there's any legislation that's going to require us to do any kind of amendment to our zoning code. Uh, which normal legislation does, then we will have to do that. Because if not, you're going to fall back automatically to state legislation. So for example, if we never amended our ordinance to comply with the ADU law, then we have to automatically revert to the state law. So like throughout any of this process through the planning period, we're going to have to continue to do those updates and we're just going to be required to do them. It's the same thing that we're currently in the fifth cycle. Every time there was new state legislation on something, we were always coming here and updating our ordinances. Okay, so that goes back to my first question. So so that will have a potential effect on on how ADUs, if, if SB9 passes, ADUs all of a sudden just being one, you can do up to four or six depending on which version gets approved. How, how are they going to, how do we factor that? How is that, I mean, are we going to be able to, to tweak that some later date so we're not having to, you know, set aside? I know that we're putting this, um, we're putting these sites down. And those sites, as you, you know, you, you said with the first question, we're stuck with those. Um, I guess there'll be some guidance to go back to HCD and, and figure out how you adjust. I mean, otherwise. Yes, but you have to remember with ADUs, it's going to depend on the income qualification. The rezone sites that you have are that high density, and that's really the key when it comes to low density. ADUs have a tendency to be more in the moderate income category and sometimes in the above moderate income category. So the question is going to be, do any of those ADUs, are they going to be counted towards that low income category? That's really going to be the big question. Right. So, so if say in in some of these areas where we have you know areas around where we have slated for affordable that someone says yeah i i, I want to do a lot split based on one of these uh, senate bills and i want to divide it down and and i want to put you know a four-story apartment uh, and we want to make it affordable and and so how do we do we have to go back and and alter or change are we going to get credit for that later on yeah so you will always get a accounted for whatever is built and if it's deed restricted in some way to guarantee it is low income. It's a matter of if you have to change the zoning, you start losing the units, that's where we have to put the units back elsewhere. But you are still going to get accounted for what is built and what it was set aside for. Okay. So that will always come in your annual housing report to HCD. Okay, great. And then the last question, I, I, or last, you know, I guess it's more of a comment than a question. But the, you know, I'm not a big fan of the residential on Sixth Street. Is there a way for us to put something in as a, as a, um, into the, the code as a buffer 
So we're not having you know residential right on Sixth Street that we have a way to, to I don't know it's mixed use or we have some kind of buffer there. So um, it it doesn't look like a it, like it's over. You know, leaning over the over the street. Absolutely, as I indicated, we will have three years to do that. Um, I, I think the city, the best interest would be to hire a consultant to come up with kind of like a small version, similar to a specific plan, and come up with those design guidelines. Absolutely, okay. because you want to have those objective design guidelines in there, which the law allows you to have. The law just doesn't let you have subjective ones. So you definitely want to put that in place. So if there needs to be the setback and whatever that buffer needs to be from the street, the city can definitely is allowed to do that through its design process and ordinance adoption. Okay, great. That's all I had. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Councilmember Daddario? You said you had questions. Uh, quick question regarding the ADUs. I talked to a couple of my colleagues from other cities and they're saying that they are looking at um, taking existing built ADUs and um, hopefully getting those counted towards the arena numbers. I don't know if there's anything to that, but I wanted to see if there was. And then um, also, um, is there a minimum, or sorry, is there a minimum requirement for an ADU in any zone, or is that is it unlimited? So the law now says that currently you, a property, even in a single family residential zone, you can now have up to two. Originally, you can only have one. I think it wasn't even a year that went by, and now we allow two. So you have the primary dwelling and now two more. So you have three residential units that you could currently have on a single family zone property. But is there, is there a minimum or maximum requirements for an ADU? In terms of numbers or design standards? As, as far as um, size. So Corona has always been flexible. So yes, the, the law does have a maximum, but we just go based off lot coverage. We've been like that even when they were secondary residential units. So if you have a piece of property and you're able to meet your setbacks and your lot coverage, we're not necessarily saying you actually have to stay in line with HCDs or the state's parameters. You can actually be a little bit bigger and that's okay. Okay, and then what about rezoning areas that, that currently have uh, an ADU to meet some of those um, requirements? Rezoning is not required for ADUs. Well, no, no, if, if we have in the city ADUs that have been built 10, 5 years ago, can we rezone those areas so that they now meet our requirements? I've heard some other cities are trying to do something like that. That I'm not familiar with, so I would have to, I would have to look at that. I'm not familiar with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Richens. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Rena, <laughs> just sounds like a bad name from a hooker from Victorville. But um, when when you're elected as an official, the one of the first things they tell you, at least in this city, they tell you is try not to waste staff time. And these Rena numbers are just ridiculous. I think the elected officials from Sacramento have wasted our city leaders' times and city staff's time. Um, I'm ashamed. I'm personally ashamed of all our state leaders in Sacramento, and these rain in numbers are really just a nothing but a waste of time. And they will end up hurting our city more than they will help improving our city. So with that, um, as far as high density residential in the circle, I would say in the surrounding streets of the circle, those streets were designed in 1886. They're too small. They can't support high density residential. And to think that you could put high density residential by small streets, again, counterproductive. I am a big fan of ADUs. Um, the more ADUs our city can sustain, I think ADUs are a valuable resource to our city. And if I've gained any glimmer of joy out of this presentation, it's uh, that the churches have stepped up and are willing to give housing to their members. And I think that's a great role. That, that's really admirable. Personally, I would like to thank Joanne. I, uh, I think she was given a task that probably no one would want. But she's a workhorse, and she's great, and she put her head down, and and she's done her homework and done a great job. And even though I don't support this project whatsoever, I do support your efforts. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Ms. 
Coletta, I do have a couple of questions. On those um, survey respondents, do we know where those folks live? So we did ask, uh, where's your zip code? And uh, we did get that in the very beginning. Now what, um, I'd have to go back and see if in the end of it, if we saw each respondent individually, we could probably, I could see if that was available, but we did get an overall number of where most of the responses came from based on zip code. I guess I'm just, I'm curious if there's a concentration, yeah. you know, of where folks live and, and considering where the lower income and households are likely to be zoned, I'm curious if we had a lot of respondents from those areas since they'll be the most impacted. Um, so I, I don't know if there's a way to, to see that next time or because there's still there's still some time before this gets submitted, right? Yeah, just off the cuff, 42% um, of the responses came from area code 92882. Okay, and that tends to be, that's the, the center. Yes, right? that's where City Hall is located. Okay, that's mm -hmm. a good number. Um, and then looking at the rezone program, what does that look like? Is there a space there where the public can have input, where the commission can input, where the city council can? Absolutely. That is something um, I'm very thankful that HCD gives us three years um, because planning just doesn't happen overnight. So yes, this is something we will come back and we'll have to engage. Um, we want to come up with development standards. We want to come up with what this looks like. So we have a plan in place. The one thing that has happened with new state legislation is that when we have to rezone property for affordable housing, we have to allow it by right after that. So we definitely want to have standards that the commission and the city council is comfortable with because it's really going to come into staff through DPR and then go into plan check. So we want to make sure we have a plan that's adopted that everybody has bought off on and said, okay, now we know if something were to come to fruition, we got the setbacks, we got the architectural style, we got the open space and so forth. So absolutely. Okay. And then lastly, I don't really understand the affordable housing overlay zone. I don't know if you can maybe explain it a little differently. Um, I don't understand how it is that this works both ways. So it's an overlay. So what it means is, so say I have a piece of property that's zoned commercial and it's currently being used for a commercial purpose. Uh, we're going to come over and have this overlay zone adopted as part of the rezone program, but it's going to be part of that outreach we're going to do in order to create those standards. The rezone is already going to be hovering over it. So we're going to do everything at one time with the rezoning and any general plan amendment to say if this were to occur in the future, someone now is going to exercise the zone that's now overlaying it. I don't have to come in like I do now every time somebody comes to me and says, well, I have this piece of property, but now I want to do this, and the zoning doesn't allow for it. I'm having to come here individually and rezone and do a general plan amendment for the applicant. With an overlay zone, that does not happen. Once you do it as part of that program, it'll stay in place as long until it's removed. Perfect. That makes sense. So much more sense to me. Thank you. Let's see if we have any cards um, or comments from the public. Ms. Edwards, are there any speaker cards or written comments from the public on this item? Mayor, yes, I have one speaker card for this item. Good afternoon. Joe Morgan, 206 Grand. It feels like a little bit of deja vu because I just saw this on Monday of planning. Um, and thank you for your questions about where the respondents came from. It was pretty interesting that you know, where should, where should housing be? It's like, well, yeah, and housing. Well, where should high density be? Yeah, over there. You know, generally the other side of town. Um, you know, and to have it say, well, it needs to be near transportation, that's a fungible item. You know, you control where the transportation is. You know, you guys do control the bus routes. And the fact that there's no, uh, you know, high density or low income housing in Arantine, you know, kind of makes you wonder. Why, this should be spread around. This should be spread around to all the places in, in Corona. You know, there's not going to be any low, low. Well, by the plan here, it doesn't even show anything really south of Ontario. I mean, there shouldn't be any high density development in Sierra de Loro or, or, uh, or, you know, anywhere over in Eagle Glen, any in that direction. That's not right. You know, just to turn the entire north side of the city into high density and low income ashtray for the rest of the city. We build what we have to build, but we're going to build it 
you know, on that side of the city is not right. You know, dumping everything in the cir in the circle and dumping everything on Sixth Street. Um, I do appreciate the response, the thoughtful response that Ms. Coletta gave the other night about it, the equity housing that you guys can do this. You can make sure that these housing, I, at least if I understood it correctly, that you have the power to make sure that it's not all concentrated in, in Tom's district because that's not right. You know, it's just not right to turn Sixth Street, Main Street, everything in the circle, uh, Main and Park Ridge, you know, just every every little place, and you're going to concentrate it all right there. Forget this whole transportation thing, because that's, you can put transportation where you need transportation. Thank you very much. Ms. Edwards, are there any other speaker cards or written comments from the public? Mayor, no, there are not. Okay. Any other questions or comments from my colleagues? No. Ms. Coletta, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Okay, moving on to the next item, which is actually listed as number three, but we're going to bump it up. The Department of Water and Power Organizational, Operational, and Financial Audit. And presenting on this item is uh, Ms. Katie Hockett, Assistant General Manager. The floor is yours. Good afternoon. So we actually have two presentations for you this afternoon. Raf Tellis, who conducted the audit, is going to go ahead and give you uh, an overview of their findings. And then when they're done, uh, we can either do questions then, or we can uh, then I will present and give you kind of our department's interpretation of the audit and our, how we plan to implement their recommendations, and then we can do questions then. So it's to your your pleasure there. So I'll go ahead and introduce Seth Garrison and Jim Armstrong from Raftalis to give you a, an overview of their findings. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon. I want to start by thanking the staff of the department who worked very hard to get us the information we requested and make staff available. They were very cooperative in doing that and very helpful to us. Uh, we asked a lot of questions of them to try to get uh, under the surface to find out what was going on and uh, they accommodated us very well. So thank you both for doing that and please thank the staff as well too. So we're going to do just a quick overview of the project and then go right into key takeaways. And I think as we get into the key takeaways, what you might find really interesting is some of the benchmarking information that we put together. Um, so that's going to be right after the overview section. But before we do that, I'll just quickly introduce our uh, core team that worked on this. Myself, I was the project director uh, along with Jim Armstrong and uh, Ben Kittleson, who couldn't be with us tonight. Uh, both Jim and I have uh, extensive background working for municipalities and working for utilities. Uh, in fact, Jim is a retired city manager uh, as well, uh, and uh, I sit on the board of a utility. So, and just a little bit of our firm, uh, Raf Tellus, just to give you some context. We really specialize in utility and local government work and have looked at over uh, 1,200 utilities across the country and hundreds across California, serving about 25% of the U.S. population. Just to give you some context, when we look at and recommend best practices and uh, information, it comes from a vast pool of information that we've gathered uh, over uh, the last couple of decades. So with that, I'll jump right into the project overview. Uh, really, the function of the project was to compare the DWP against industry best practices uh, and peer organizations, and then look at practices and process to see if there was room for improvement within that. Uh, during that process, we interviewed 34 city staff members as well as uh, five city council members uh, and requested detailed budget operations, performance SOP information, uh, as well as looking at uh, the major facilities uh, in the system. So let me jump right into the key takeaways on this. The DWP is a high-performing organization, looking at both the metrics and the practices. Uh, but one thing that comes out very clearly is the staffing is lean compared to peer utilities. Uh, they produce relatively more water and serve relatively more customers uh, per employee than the peers. And um, when we looked at the peers, we looked at that information before we made any observations. So there was absolutely no cherry picking going on. We selected who would, we thought would be the most comparable as organizations before we did any of the statistics. So these are conclusions we came to after really reviewing the data thoroughly. So, 
Uh, some of the areas that really uh, perhaps are the leanest are the need for additional engineering support and coordination. Um, and uh, some uh, opportunities to adhere to some best practices in some of the other areas, in the areas of advanced metering infrastructure, uh, work in capital targets, and then implementing reliability center maintenance. Uh, one thing that you'll probably be very interested in, we did point out in the report that because of the new Prop uh, 18 uh, laws, and uh, are not laws, the uh, findings from the court, you may want to look at the uh, Corona Utility Authority lease structure uh, a little bit more thoroughly. So let me get into the benchmarking because I think this is the most revealing uh, some of the numbers. And you can see here the list of some of the organizations that we compared uh, the DWP with. Uh, most of them were water and wastewater entities, although there were several water, wastewater, electric uh, entities as well as water and electric entities out there. And obviously there is no exact comparison for the city's DWP, but we tried to find those that were closely related in terms of the population services uh, and or the, uh, the way that they operated. So this graphic, I think, uh, captures a lot of uh, the conclusions that we came to. If you look at the number of water customer accounts per employee, that's really the productivity of the staff within the department. How many customers can they serve uh, with each employee? And you can see Corona stands up above uh, many of the other peers and also stands up above the AWWA, which is the American Water Works Association median benchmark as well, too. So this statistic alone tells us right now that there's a uh, high degree of productivity in the staff compared to peers. You can also, too, look at that in terms of water production amount, how much water is produced per employee. Uh, you can see here, again, the city of Corona leads the group that we looked at uh, with Riverside as a close second, uh, but still quite ahead of the AWWA median and quite ahead of the peers. Uh, not as much of a difference on the wastewater side, but still one of the top uh, wastewater treated per employee members. And out of the peer group, there were only, only three others that were comparable in terms of how they were doing the wastewater. So uh, the peer group's a little smaller on this one, but we still believe that it's, it's significant. Looking individually, and again, there's much more detail in the report, but looking specifically at the various departments, this gives you an example of sort of where uh, the DWP stands. This is the number of customer accounts per customer care uh, employee. So these are the folks directly working with the customers, handling billing, doing outreach, handling calls. Uh, and you can see here that uh, the city came in number two beside uh, your Belinda Water District. So, and much uh, better than many of the peers as well, too. So, again, this is showing that there is a um, large service population per employee. So let me get into some of the individual areas, starting with drinking water treatment. Uh, for those of you who have seen their system, are familiar with the system out there, they operate a very complex water system with multiple sources that all need to be blended and managed uh, and a whole slew of rules depending on the sources and, uh, and what they're using. And that requires a very skilled staff to do that. Uh, and with that staff, they've had a very good compliance history. Um, the staffing is, we would, I guess, say adequate for what they have right now. It's certainly not um, it's not excessive. It's about where it needs to be. One area that we did point out is this area of reliability-centered maintenance. And, and really what that is sort of for the, the layperson is being able to look at the condition of equipment and do preventative, predictive maintenance uh, on things really, instead of more reactive type maintenance. So we thought there was some work that could be done in that area to uh, help preserve the condition of assets. Water reclamation, very similar uh, situation. Uh, they have been very good at meeting regulatory requirements um, and very good at providing high quality wastewater services. Uh, area here that we uh, noted that needed some uh, improvement was on the communication between operations and maintenance staff. And we credit a lot of that to some newer staff in the area. The folks working on the water side had been working together a little bit longer, and this was sort of a new group. Um, so, but we, we think they're moving ahead. But there's more detail on that in the report as well. 
As far as infrastructure and facilities goes, uh, one thing that is odd, and I'm sure you know, is the maintenance service department, how that is organized within the public works uh, function, or within the uh, DWP function. Uh, that's a little bit unusual for utilities to have that, to have uh, that mixed in and to have sort of superintendents over infrastructure. I know that's something you're, you're looking at that, but I'm just calling that out because that is a little bit different than how other utilities uh, would do that. Uh, there's very effective use of SCADA technology. That's sort of the automation technology. And uh, there are 18 high maintenance areas within the system uh, as well that are being looked at. And a very acceptable water loss. And again, I'm, I'm looking at some of the key highlights here. There's certainly a lot more detail in the report. As far as electric utility goes, uh, small operation relative to the other operations that you have. There has been a little bit of a decrease in consumption uh, from some shifting uh, of accounts around. Uh, and then there's been a recent RFP to issue uh, to assess that a, a little bit more closely on the distribution side. So there wasn't a whole lot of findings in that area, but uh, from what we were seeing, uh, everything looked uh, appropriate. So let me talk a little bit about asset management because I made the comment earlier about the reliability centered maintenance. And uh, I think Corona is in sort of a unique time. You have some aging facilities out there. You're looking to make some capital investments. So we highlighted very heavily in the report really that need to have the right engineering staff and to have the right collaboration with operators so that you can maintain those facilities and keep those investments going. So asset management was a big focus of our report. Um, they're doing very well in that area right now, but we felt that there was some more room that they had to grow there. And uh, principally, that's perhaps adding some more resources on the engineering side of the house. Uh, and again, some more focus with the reliability centered maintenance on the maintenance end. In terms of the administration functions, we look very closely at the budget, finances, uh, how money uh, was allocated between uh, the enterprise fund and, and the general fund. We did not find any issues there uh, with that. Everything appeared appropriate for us. Again, as I mentioned on my initial slide, we did recommend looking at the Joint Powers Authority uh, with the recent rulings with Prop 218. And Jim, I don't know if you want to talk on that a little bit and, and just mention the Prop 218 finding. Good afternoon. Yeah, in terms of the the um, the utility authority, when we looked at it with, and I've looked at other cities, we talked a little with some attorneys in the business, and it's it's a very unusual arrangement where the utility is leasing the water facilities and the in the wastewater facilities from the city and paying an annual rent payment. Um, when it was developed, I think close to 20 years ago, um, you had good legal counsel that um, you know gave you recommendations on how to do that. But there's been some recent rulings by the courts on, I think, a little stricter interpretations of Prop 218. Um, our job is not to give legal advice, but we thought you should at least ask your city attorney's office to look at it again and just make sure you're consistent with um, with Prop 218 and state law. Uh, a couple of the other items I wanted to highlight as well, too, is the meter reading technology. Right now you have a vendor uh, doing uh, meter reading for you. Uh, you're in the process of looking at implementing a meter reading technology. We definitely concur with that and recommend that. Uh, I think that's going to provide you with uh, some more information and much better services to the customers. Uh, it's other administrative items to take a look at, uh, you know, there's very strong financial management and detailed cost allocation, as I mentioned before, uh, but there is some room for standardization and simplification with how the FTEs are allocated, and that's detailed in the report. Uh, we also recommended adopting a working capital policy as well, similar to fund balance policy for the general fund. And then also looking at rates a little bit more frequently. Uh, I know you had a a uh, challenging experience with the last rate increase that you went through and uh, really looking at and planning those on an annual basis and seeing how um, how those need to be implemented I think is uh, something that we would recommend. So, and finally, uh, I know you uh, have recently finished or was in process when we were doing that as the compensation study for the DWP staff and the city staff as well too. 
Uh, in terms of structure and staffing, uh, we know that you have some ongoing work going right now, and our recommendation was to continue separating non-utility related maintenance service department work groups from the DWP. Uh, there's uh, some reasons outlined in the report for that. Um, back to the engineering, we did recommend additional project management and analytical capacity within DWP, really to prepare for some of these infrastructure investments and to manage the assets uh, perhaps a little bit uh, more thoroughly and uh, some opportunities to improve coordination and, and work planning with the engineering staff since they sit in a different group. So with that, I will open it up for questions. If you have any specific questions for me or uh, let it go to Katie and her presentation. Thank you. Let's, let's pause for a second and see if my colleagues have questions. Go ahead, Councilman Virgins. A um, couple, couple questions, couple comments. The, uh, the page with the Fastenal vending machines, are those, do we have those vending machines? Yes, we do. They're part of our warehouse inventory process. Okay, so then this is going to go back to the last council meeting if I, where we talked about Granger. I'm now going to talk about Fastenal, and they're a ripoff. So I, and especially if they're stocking in vending machines, whatever product is in a vending machine is probably a product that you're using a lot. And if I understand correctly, our city owns a warehouse. We don't need vending machines. We can buy in bulk and store in, a, in the warehouse. So, Roger, I'm hoping with the Granger audit, we can now add the Fastenal audit. And, it, and it, I'm sorry, but if drunk convenience spending, just to overpay for convenience, it's, it, it needs to be a mindset. For far too long, Granger, Fastenal, Companies such as these have structured themselves for people to order parts, materials, products, where they don't look at price, they look at the ease of ordering. And they, these products are twice, sometimes three times more expensive. And I don't think our city should be participating with tax dollars in that behavior. So, uh, Fastenal. And uh, next would be... Uh, you recommended a rate increase every year. I, I think that's a little aggressive, but, but what do I know? I would probably recommend every two to three years. And then um, with your report, I really liked that you guys um, compared the surrounding water agencies. I thought that was very valuable, and kudos to you guys for going to those efforts and not giving us Carlsbad, Sacramento, and. God knows where. You, you picked the surrounding agencies, and I find a lot of value in that. Last, uh, I actually read the 88 pages to this report. So uh, the SCADA and the 18 high maintenance areas, it seems like we need more exploration there. And I'm hoping that we can get more exploration there and find better ways forward. And with that, thank you. All right. Uh, Council Member Jadario, questions? Uh, good afternoon. Um, what was the project timeline for this? Uh, I believe the timeline was about, uh, what, 18 months, I think? Yeah, something in that range. Do you recall like when it started, when it ended? Yeah, obviously we got a little slowed down because of the pandemic. Uh, you know, we started prior to the pandemic, and I believe, was it November of 19? No, it was, it was after the rate increase, so it would have been in March of 2020. When it started? Is when we started. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, great. Um, so then, other than other than just general um, location to the city of Corona, was there was there what type of criteria was used to um, uh, define what a peer was? Because as I'm looking at this benchmarking sheet. Um, the population served is kind of all over the board. Really, only Pasadena and Elsinore Valley seem to be uh, anywhere close to us as far as the population served. So was there another criteria used? or? Yeah, well, again, uh, there were about five different criteria. One was population, obviously. One was the sort of the basket of services they offer. 
governmental structure. You know, there's a lot of special authorities and districts around, so we tried to find ones uh, that were mostly city department type functions. Uh, and then again, we tried to find ones that were relatively close by. We didn't look really at Northern California or other areas. We really wanted stuff in sort of the greater Los Angeles area. Okay, and then there was a slide in your presentation um, regarding the customer accounts per customer care full-time employee, yep. where Corona ranked second behind your Belinda. And if I'm reading that correctly, you had actually said that, I believe that you said that was a good thing, that, that we had 3,423 customer accounts per full-time employee. Um, is that a good thing, that we have that many accounts per employee? Yes, I would say good. I would say it, it's efficient. You are serving a lot of employees, a lot of customers with the staff that you have. Okay, because in your in your key takeaways, you had highlighted that one of the areas that you think that we could benefit from is additional engineering support and coordination. Um, do you look at the customer service as part of your as part of your survey to say, you know, are are our DWP customers efficiently being served and with a high level of care? I'm really glad you asked that question because this is a fairly complicated one. A lot of times people will look and say lean is good. Some times people will say lean is bad because they want to provide a higher level of service. So really what we tried to do is say, are your departments accomplishing the mission that they are set out to do? And with the customer service group, they are meeting the mission, but the staffing is lean there. On the engineering side and asset management side, we looked at that and said, they're not quite meeting the mission that they were set out to do. So the leanness there is not a good thing compared to some of the others. Okay, my last question is that you had spoke um, and about recomm recommending um, the separation between DWP and maintenance services. And so in the total employees in the peer benchmarking, you have 110.85. I'd like to meet 0.85, by the way. Just saying. <laughs> but you have 110.85 uh, employees. Did you separate out the maintenance? We did. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Only the utility staff. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Council Member Steiner. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you for your presentation. I think uh, it's, well, it is very consistent with the other audits we've done that confirm that we're low on staffing, which I think many of us already knew. I look forward to Katie's presentation kind of consolidating all the recommendations so we can see them one right after the other. Um, to get to the uh, so Tom's comment about you know the rate increases every two or three years instead of every year, I, I get it. Um, but you know, staff was recommending rate increases back in 2014, and nobody on the council at the time wanted to go near it because it would aff affect their political career. And so they wait seven years, or six, six or seven years, and they do a rate study on their way out that we didn't know about, and we get elected, and all of a sudden, it's recommending 5% increases for a year every five years, which was horrible. So I actually like the very small incremental increases as necessary along the way so we don't get hit seven years down the road with these, this huge increase. So those are just my thoughts. Thank you. you know, if I may, I just want to respond to that. So to be very clear, what we suggest in the report is looking at rates every year. Because I think you really need to be very deliberate if you're going to put off a rate increase and need to look at it every year and what the implications are that are of that. Um, and the reason we say that is because a lot of times city councils like yourselves get blindsided with the accumulation of needed repairs or needed rates that come in, and then all of a sudden it's sprung on you that you have to deal with us. So we really much uh, advocate for looking at these things every year and allowing you to make a deliberate decision about what to do. I agree with you. Mayor, I would, uh, as usual, Steiner is smarter than me, and I will, uh, I will walk back my comments on the two to three years and Thank go you, with the so smarter much. man. Uh, Vice Mayor? Yeah, I, I would not recommend doing a, a rate increase every, even every two years, only if we actually need. So thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. I, I wanted to comment a little bit about um, you had cost per full-time employee, but you also noted in the report that um, 
the city has a lot of consultants that we we do sub we subcontract. I hate the word, but we subcontract work. So it's not always the apples to apples. So I thought that the and I was happy to see the uh, cost per customer account, yeah. which I thought was really more of a true a true measure. And it put us, you know, we weren't quite the lowest, uh, but we weren't the highest. We were definitely the lower third from what I saw, both on the uh, wastewater and on the utility. Um, and in the water, so that that kind of told the story for me. Really, kind of when you're really talking about dollars to uh, to people, it's dollars to residents. So, yeah, it's really looking at the whole basket of metrics to yeah, understand what the. I, I like that. I I appreciated that that number a little bit better, and I thought that was uh, more indicative. Um, and also, thank you for for mentioning that uh, our FTEs for customer accounts are are you know, very lean. Um, but as you said, state meeting the requirement and making sure because I that's one thing I don't hear too many complaints about um, is about our, our our staff on the on the customer service side. I hear usually good things, so uh, that's that's a that's some truth to that. Um, and then you, you mentioned about uh, the engineering costs and how engineering being more focused. And you also mentioned that we hadn't we're a little bit behind on some of those uh, those things. How are we? How had we been? Um, accomplishing our engineering using, I know that that staff was transferred over to a different department and being kind of used, how, how was it being done? How was it, uh, how did you measure that? Well, we, we looked at what um, was required for them to do, obviously the number of capital projects, the number of reports. They, as you mentioned before, outsource a lot of activities. There's a lot of consultants that work with the engineering folks, but it's a relatively small group compared to the size of the utility. So. When we came in, we saw some projects that hadn't fully been completed yet. They were dragging out a little bit. Um, we saw some capital things that needed to be done that had been pushed out because of some staffing and other issues. So really looking at, are you delivering the capital plan that you need to to stay up um, with what the needs are of the system? And that's really how we, we did our judgment. Okay. And I also noticed that there are some capital projects that were, that were in the... Um, uh, rate study that that haven't shown up yet. So I know those are still coming, and I know that we're we're still pushing for those. Um, so one of the things that that um, that uh, well, it was Vice Mayor Steiner at the time, but uh, brought up as is something that we wanted to make sure we looked at after we got into the current set of rates for the next couple of years is doing a true up and kind of seeing where we are and compared to um, how the rate study was done. Kind of seeing you know have we uh, have we allocated money the the way that we thought we would. Is the the capital and prob, um, improvement projects that we have either pending or in are are they still valid? Are those numbers still valid? Um, you know, making sure that 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 five percent increase that we've we uh, were beat into submission to on uh, the the twenty on in twenty twenty that that it's still needed for the entire five years, or is there a way for us to phase you know phase that in? Is there is there anything that instead of doing a full blown rate study, is there a a shortcut, a true up uh, that we can do that's in between that would that would help us see if we're on target. Are we missing target? Yeah. So let let me explain that a little bit. Is when we and other groups come in and do a rate study. Really, what the rate study is is are the costs properly allocated across your different customer groups, and are you meeting your revenue requirements? Now, assuming that the costs are properly allocated, you could look at that independently from year to year. Are you meeting the costs? Are you delivering capital that you need to? So really, that doesn't require having a consultant come in to answer that. That's really just a budgetary issue rather than a, a cost allocation issue. Thank you. That, that helps out quite a bit. And um, Mr. Alsa, I, I'd love to find a way for us to, to schedule that at, at some point to get a, a peek at that where we are and compared to... Uh, the our, our the rate study. You'll be pleased to know that's on our September 29th council workshop. Awesome. Thank I you. might just add on on rates and kind of how it all flows together. And what you should really think of is having a 10-year financial forecast for the utilities. And the bottom line is is the fund balance. And we talk a little about what you should establish a policy for the fund balance. And of course that'll include operations and it'll include capital. And then one of the things that typically happens is capital doesn't get delivered as quickly as we as it was pro forecast in the 10-year plan. And some of that's because the resources aren't available on the engineering side. Sometimes things just get delayed. 
And so that what you want to do is every year you look at that 10-year forecast. You say, okay, this is what we forecast we'd have to do on rates. But look, we've got higher fund balance than we expected or lower fund balance than we expected. So we can either delay the rate increase or make it smaller. And then and that'll be the impact on the, on the, on the fund balance out over 10 years. And so you kind of want it all to go together of the 10-year forecast on revenues and expenditures and especially the capital because that's the one that can really affect that cash, the cash balance. And then you look at the rates every year and you tweak them um, you know, as, as you go forward. And generally what happens is the 10-year forecast, you're, a little, you're probably optimistic on capital. And so then you can pull back a little bit. But then you also have to say, if you pull back too much, then three years down the road, you're going to get rate shock again. So that's kind of how it all should come together. Okay, and, and that's one of the things that you guys did review, and, and this is the, the fund balance part and seeing where we – so, you know, I guess I didn't, uh, I didn't catch that part in the, in the report. But fund balance-wise, where are we compared to our peers? You're in good shape, but you don't have a policy. So you don't, like you have one for the general fund, and what you do need to look at is what's your fund policy for the, both the utilities so that, because, you know, if you've got a, catastro- a catastrophe like um, an earthquake or something like that, you, you've got to say, okay, we're going to need three months of, you know, or six months of fund balance there. And so we really think you, you, you need to have that, that policy because that will also help your rate discussions. And in terms of, okay, in year two, we're going to go below our policy, so we're going to need to tweak the rates. Or sometimes you push back a capital project for a year so you can keep the, 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 the fund balance you need. Okay. Yeah, because I, I thought we did, we did talk about a fund balance. Maybe I'm remembering that wrong. I thought we had a fund balance uh, number at least. But are you, are you saying that we had a fund balance policy number, an objective that we were targeting? An objective of what the number was. I think that was one of the discussion points at the time. Again, you know, it's 18 months ago or so now. but That is correct. So in the rate study, they did give us a projection that we should target, but we do not have a physical written policy that says that value is equal to 90 days of the operating budget of the utility. We follow the same general guideline that the general fund follows, which is that 90-day operating reserve, and that's the value that we target. But we don't have one that's specifically written for the utility. Okay, so so we've had a we've had a thumb, but we yeah okay great all right that's fine. Um, I think uh, that was it. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, Councilmember Daddario, uh, I had the exact same thought about you know what lean means and whether or not that's a good thing. And I, I don't, I don't interpret lean in customer service to be a good thing. Um, but your definition of you know you've audited and 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 checked to see if they're meeting the mission, um, and so we are and we're doing so at an efficient rate. Um, that. I'm pleased to hear it, um, but whenever I see lean, I, I worry about overextension of staff. I worry about not meeting customer care service, and um, and so that's where my mind goes. It doesn't go to efficiency. So thanks for the expl- explanation there. I also agree with Councilmember Steiner about um, you know um, the delay in our rate increases and how that just was not wise, and um, you're not. We're not saying that we need annual increases. We are saying that we need annual reviews. So I appreciate that. Um, I did want to hear a bit more about, you know, this lease structure compliance um, with case law and Prop 218. I, I know you advised that we speak with our city attorney about it. But I was wondering if you could share a little bit about how other cities do this. How, what does it look like in other cities? Sure, Jim, I'll defer to you on that one. So it's not uncommon to have joint powers authorities established to do financing for utilities and for and for general funds where you have a you know like a corona municipal financing authority to issue normally they issue what's called certificates of participation but in your situation what happened is and this was back in 2002 and we went through all the source documents is you created the um, corona utility authority and it didn't issue any bonds. It basically is, is it's, it's kind of the mother now of the utility. And then it's leasing the utility facilities from the, basically the city but, or the general fund. 
And those facilities were, in many cases, they were contributed, they were, they were a requirement of development by developers, or they were constructed, you know, based upon, from revenues from the water utility and the wastewater utility. So the general fund didn't do anything that, you know, to be paid back. Um, and so, I mean, it's an, it's an interesting concept to move money into the general fund, but if there's, there's no underlying debt that you're paying for, it's, it's a rent that was calculated based on the long-term life of the, of the facility. Um, but it's, I've, there are, I, I did find a couple others like this that were done around the same time. And, and my understanding is, is and, and, and I remember back in early, early 2000s where there was a push to contract out or, or basically sell utilities and privatize them. And then those private vendors would pay the city. And so from what, you know, just kind of speculating, it appears that this was a way to kind of do that, but basically keep it within the city structure. Um, but it's, I mean, we were just concerned when we looked at it. We, I hadn't seen that in other cities, and I've looked at a lot of them, um, that is it still consistent with Prop 218? Um, and we, we wanted to, you know, we, we talked a little to the city attorney about it, said, you know, we think you may just want to look at it again and make sure you're still consistent with law. We're confident, I think, back in when it was done that it was consistent with law. I was looked at very carefully, but, you know, the law is changing. There's been some, some fairly, you know, adverse judgments that some cities have had, you know, just recently. Okay. Good to know. Thank you. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Can I follow up? You said back in 2002 is when the city decided to... Um, rent back their facilities. Is it possible that that was done as a way to offset depreciation? Um, well, it's not really depreciation. You're still charging depreciation within the utility. It, it's, it was really, it's a, it's a, the way it's structured, it's a, it's, a, it's a lease purchase payment from the, that the utility authority pays to the city. Um, it was originally, um, they did kind of a, 50-year schedule of, of, it looked like depreciation or wearing out, but it was, then it was actually, originally it was a percentage of the water utilities revenues and, and the wastewater utilities revenues. I mean, I, it, it's, when I looked at it, I said, boy, when I was a city manager, I wish I had thought of this um, because it, 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 it does help out the general fund, but I just, I think now um, you just need to look at it and make sure you're still consistent with law. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, last question from me. Um, in the administrative takeaways, you spoke about DWP has strong financial management and detailed cost allocation process, um, room for standardization and simpl simplification with FTE allocation. I just wonder if you could speak a little bit more about the strong financial management and detailed cost allocation process. Yeah, so this is how we end up with those fractional FTEs that you were talking about before. <laughs> Um, you know, they go through this process of really looking at where um, the FTEs are providing services to the utility and lining that up uh, on a line by line, almost person by person basis. So that's extremely detailed how they do it. And there's, there's a very de uh, detailed rationale for how they do that. It, it's very difficult to explain in, uh, in a very short summary. Maybe, Tom, if you want to take a crack at that. Sure, I'm a, I'm a perfect case example. I, hi, Tony, I'm 0.85. <laughs> so when we're looking at maintenance services, that is a separate department, and it is, it is funded from the 110 general fund category. And so in this detailed cost analysis, if somebody's working for the general fund, the 110 fund, we want to make sure that their time is allocated. Similarly, 570, the water utility fund, is a separate fund, just like 572 is the sewer fund. So water, sewer, electric, recycled water, and the general fund are the five categories that we primarily work in. And if an employee is working in sewer, we need to charge their time accordingly. So when you get to a maintenance mechanic or myself, for example, as I oversee all five divisions, if you will, I have to account for my time appropriately within each of those categories. So if I spend 30% of my time working for the water department and managing the water department, then 30% of my funding for my paycheck comes from the water department. Similarly, I spend 10% of my time working for the general fund overseeing building maintenance, street, fleet, 
those categories. I need to account for myself accordingly in those categories. That's where we get to the 0.85. And that, that is a very detailed process where we list the 35 funds that we are covered under and account for each person individually throughout the entire water uh, um, DWP maintenance services structure. Okay, that makes sense. And I was happy to read that as a takeaway. We appreciate it. Thank you yeah, so much. Yeah, so just to go a little bit step further on that, I think one of the things that we highlight and to go a layer deeper is that, you know, obviously Tom is not doing his timesheet every day with every hour that he's spending. So it's an allocation based on what the projection is and number of folks in the different utilities and what he estimates. So we were just recommending that that process get streamlined a little bit, if that makes yeah. sense. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay, let's go to the second part <laughs> of this presentation. Ms. Hockett. And I neglected to mention when I introduced, but uh, the uh, the final report of the audit it is online because it's you know it's attached to today's agenda. But we will also put it on our website, and then also there's a section on the finance uh, website, the finance department section of the website that has audits, and we'll have it added there too, so it'll be fully available. It won't just be tied to this meeting. So I forgot to mention that when we got started. So like I said, we're going to talk about what our interpretations were and then what our implementation schedule will look like, uh, and we'll just jump right in. So I'm not going to give you much of an overview since we've already really, really talked about that, but we'll go into the immediate recommendations, short term, and then long term. So I, I do want to start by saying uh, that that DWP staff was really grateful for the opportunity to participate in the audit and to have the department evaluated. Uh, as Raf Tellis mentioned, they did interview 35 staff members uh, across multiple, multiple divisions, multiple levels within the department. Um, they did site visits and uh, observed operations. Uh, and this audit gives us you know, we, we have some benchmarking now. We have some areas where we're doing really well, some areas where we need to make some improvements, and this really gives us a roadmap for how we can do that going forward, where we can apply those resources. So we are grateful to have the results of this audit, and we, we did appreciate the opportunity to participate in it. Um, they did identify 22 recommendations, which are outlined in the report, uh, and they briefly went over. Uh, and again, we, we do plan to incorporate regular assessments like this as part of future rate studies uh, which we, we heard uh, during the last rate study process. So we, ha we do have the 22 recommendations, and we've categorized these into immediate, short, and long term. So there's five immediate recommendations, which we call zero to six months, uh, nine short term, which we're calling six to 12 months, and then eight long term, which we're calling one to three years. So on the immediate recommendations, uh, recommendation number one, and these are how they're referenced in the audit report. So these are not in any chronological order at all. They're just, this is just how they're in the report. So we wanted it to be easy to refer back. Um, would be to continue separating the non-utility related maintenance services groups from DWP. Um, as we discussed, this is in progress. Park maintenance has already been moved to community services. And I know that city management is working on additional changes at this time. Recommendation number five is to develop a policy for assigning overtime to DWP staff, kind of going back to that lean staffing and making sure that uh, that we're not, you know, demanding too much of staff. So that, again, is in progress, and we're going to work on documenting and formalizing our internal overtime policies that we're already complying with and making tweaks here and there to make sure that, that that's appropriate. Recommendation number 14 is to resolve communication and coordination challenges between the uh, operations and maintenance groups, which uh, Seth mentioned briefly. Um, this is already in progress. We are we do have regularly scheduled meetings with these groups so that they're meeting, um, I think it's every two weeks, uh, to go over projects that are in the works, projects that are coming up, things that need to get done at the facilities. So that's that's happening now. And recommendation number 15 is to review the work order process. Uh, so different groups use the, the work order system in different ways and wanting to make sure that everybody's using the system in the same way and that that process is well understood by staff across the department. So we're addressing this in conjunction with the previous recommendation um, through those regularly scheduled meetings. The, uh, the water reclamation group, uh, the water reclamation operations group 
and maintenance group meet regularly and the water operations and maintenance group meet regularly. And then recommendation number 21 is to review the location of DWP engineering in the organizational structure. As we said, this is in progress and I know that the options are currently being evaluated by city management. Any questions on those or we wanna just keep going? Any questions? Saying none, we can go. <laughs> okay. So the short-term recommendations, again, these are the ones we've categorized as six to 12 months. Um, so we've further categorized these down because there's quite a few of them. So the first group is employee relations. So there are two recommendations, three and four, that are related to the compensation study. Um, one is communicating regularly with our staff, and then the other is to implement the recommendations of the study. Uh, that the study is being spearheaded by the HR department, but we believe that six to 12 months is a good time frame on that. Uh, the structure review, which we've talked about, is to review the Corona Utility Authority lease structure to ensure that it complies. Um, that, you know, we hear that recommendation loud and clear and we'll work with the city attorney's office on, on getting that done. We did have an evaluation done in 2002 as part of the formation and then again in 2011, um, but we have no problem going back out to get an additional opinion on that. Um, under a resources category, we want to continue implementation of AMI uh, technology. We agree with that recommendation as well. Uh, we do have $500,000 in the uh, fiscal year 2022 budget to get a consultant on board to help us manage that project and design that project, how that's gonna look. Uh, we, we wanna make sure that that program meets our customers' needs, and so we wanna, we wanna have a team guiding us to, to get this project uh, done. The actual implementation of the project itself would start in the next fiscal year. So the six to 12 months is really for us to get this project kick-started, uh, the design work done, and then, um, and then we would start the project next, next year. And then we have five recommendations related to process improvements. So the first one is to meet with admin services and go through our invoice processing. We don't have any issues with that. And uh, we've already talked to Ms. Sitton about ma making sure that we get started on that. Um, revising the home account allocation processes to, to see about simplifying those splits between the FTEs. We do this anyway as part of our annual budget prep is to look at each position and confirm that the account breakdown is accurate. So we would do that again in the as part of our um, budget preparation for fiscal year 2023. So we, we plan to implement this recommendation of looking at it and simplifying it as part of that budget process since we're going to do that anyway, trying to be efficient with our resources. Uh, number 11 is to establish a working capital target policy. Again, you know we have best practices we've been using. We, we absolutely agree that there should be a policy and we'll work on that in the next six to 12 months along with the finance department. Uh, number 18 and ni number 19 are related to the fleet uh, division and how DWP vehicles are classified in fleet. Um, so each year the fleet division conducts an annual review of how much it costs to operate each vehicle. And then we charge what's called a motor pool rate to each unit. Um, and that includes their operation and maintenance. And in some cases it includes their replacement value. Uh, DWP has six vehicles that are called on account units, which means they're not part of fleet. They're maintained outside of fleet. Uh, and so we can look into what the cost would be to incorporate that into the fleet program. Um, if there's some kind of true up, we would do that as part of the fiscal year 2023 fleet motor pool process because we're going to, again, we're gonna try to be efficient with our resources. We're gonna do that anyway. So we would incorporate that then. And then um, most of the DWP vehicles, all of the DWP vehicles do not pay the replacement component of the uh, motor pool rate. They just pay the uh, operations and maintenance um, because if we're, if we, if, if there's time where we need a truck and that truck has, you know, has met its useful life, we budget it in the DWP budget as a capital expense rather than having fleet budget it. Uh, and that was just to ensure that DWP vehicles were getting replaced. Um, so there again would be some kind of true up where we would need to make sure that 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 money was available in the city's fleet budget to replace those vehicles when the time comes due. So again, we would do that as part of the fiscal year 2023 budget. Any question you want me to move on? Okay. Couple. Go ahead, Councilmember Daria. Thank you. Um, 
on um, uh, recommendation number 22, the the advanced metering infrastructure technology you talked about going out for art was it going out for RFP for design? Yeah, we we want to go out for RFP for basically a project facilitator to help us guide that project to completion. Okay, so it's not really for design then; it's just for program manager, you know, process management or program management, I should say. Right, and to help help us review available technologies. You know where would that those technologies need to be located? Those kinds of things too. And if I heard you correctly, you said you budgeted five hundred thousand dollars for this. Yes. Okay. Interested to see the RFP. And then my next question is on uh, number eighteen. Um, you talked about incorporating the six on-account DWP uh, vehicles into the motor pool, um, but you said that that was going to be for twenty twenty-three, and I. Didn't, I Maybe I misheard that incorrectly, but I didn't figure out how you were going to do that in six to 12 months. Okay. So we, in usually like around the beginning of November, we start to look at the rates for the vehicles. Uh, so we would, when I say 2023, I mean the, the fiscal year 2023 budget process, which we start in fall of 2020, 20, what year? 2021. <laughs> so we would get that started in October, or November as part of our budget preparation process for next fiscal year. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just had a really quick question about um, the structure review number 10. Um, is this doable within six to 12 months? We believe that it is based on our conversations with the city attorney's office, but if, if not, we can certainly extend that. It just sounded really complicated to me. Um, the legal issues involved are complicated, uh, no doubt. Um, but there was outside law firm uh, that helped put together the Corona Utility Authority uh, around the same time your electric utility was created and those various activities took, took place. I believe that same law firm also looked at the issue in 2011. Mm -hmm. And so it shouldn't be dif difficult to go back to them um, and ask them the the question yeah. again. There might be related issues that come out of that that we'll we'll discuss, but it should not be difficult to get that opinion from them. So, all right. Any other questions, Vice Mayor? Thank you. You know, I can can I go, 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 go without it. having a question. The on account vehicles, um, those are enterprise vehicles, correct? They're not. They're actually uh, mostly Toyota Tacomas and I think a couple of Tundras that we purchased in two thousand twelve or two thousand thirteen. They are there for the most part not. They're not enterprise vehicles. They were vehicles that we purchased outright. At the time, the city wasn't replacing vehicles, and we had a need to get some new vehicles because the ones we had were pretty pretty aging. Okay, so these these six on account vehicles are they 2012 models? Is that I, what they are? I be, off the top of my head, I believe that they are 2012 models, and they are they are Toyota Tacomas and Toyota Tundras, and so we staff takes them to to the dealership for the work to get done. And when I say staff, I mean the staff that's operating them, not the fleet staff. Sure. Okay, great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay, let's keep going. All right. So the long-term recommendations, there's eight of these. Again, we've kind of lumped these together into some different categories, and these are ones we're looking at one to three years on, on, these, on implementation for these. Uh, so in the process improvement category, uh, one of the recommendations was to integrate the purchase order prioritization process into one solution. So this this kind of generally went back to purchasing as a as a process. Um, I will say we've made immediate improvements here. So even though this is in the one to three year mark, we, we have made Im immediate improvements. Um, purchasing has been working really hard to make a lot of improvements there. Um, we meet regularly with purchasing every two weeks to go over our current projects because obviously DWP maintenance services have a lot of projects that are in the works that need to um, need purchasing support, need to go out to bid. So we have seen an immediate improvement. Um, again, this the audit was a snapshot in time, so so we're looking at, at at that snapshot. As far as integrating the purchase order process into one solution, um, and they, they get into this more in the report. We have a, um, a, system, a process that the city uses called P-Track that's not part of one solution. So the data gets entered there, and then it gets re-entered into one solution. And so there's some efficiency loss there. Um, whether or not that can actually happen, if we can actually make that happen, 
that we could prior we could use the systems the same way. It, 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 we're not sure, but I know that um, in talking with finance and IT that they have plans over the next several fiscal years to to go out to RFP for different financial software. So I, uh, that's why that's in the one to three year. Um, regularly assessing and increasing rates to reflect the annual changes in our costs and uh, planned capital investments. Um, we've talked about this uh, quite a bit already, but um, right now our current rate increase goes through January of 2024. Our, our plan right now, and we'll show this at the end too, is that in uh, July of 2023, we would go out to RFP for a consultant to do another rate uh, another rate study to give us an idea of what our five-year, 10-year horizon looks like. Um, and, and then we would be presenting those results back to the council in, uh, at some point in 2024. Uh, and I, I will say that, like, like Mr. Ellis mentioned, we are planning on presenting on that, uh, where we stand with our revenue collection and, uh, and the capital improvement projects in September. So that you, you will be hearing from us again on that here, here shortly. Implementing reliability centered maintenance. Again, we, we absolutely agree with this recommendation. We have a very good, uh, corrective maintenance and, um, preventive maintenance program, but that predictive maintenance. Um, is is the next level, and that's that's where we want to get to, and and we think that one to three years is a reasonable time frame for that. And then in the resources category, uh, assessing the need for project management and analyst roles, we we will look at this as part of again as part of our budget process for next fiscal year, um, because we usually will look at how many projects we have coming, uh, what kind of staffing needs that we have, and we would we would add those positions as part of the budget. So we, we would anticipate that you would be seeing those again next year during the budget process. So whenever that starts in March, April, um, uh, when we're back presenting those to you. Uh, evaluating the current outsourcing contracts to determine the cost of administering them and the performance of the contractors. Again, we agree with that and, and we'll, we'll be working on that in the next one to three years. Uh, Reviewing engineering's role in asset management, this ties pretty directly to resources. Um, so number 20, which is at the bottom, is consider additional resources for engineering. Uh, again, we completely support that and we'll be evaluating that as part of our budget process to make sure that we're asking for the right number of positions, the right amount of resources, um, and we'll do that. We do that as part of the budget anyway, so we would combine those tasks. And then number 17 is to explore collaboration opportunities between the water and water reclamation operators. As technology and treatment um, start to merge, for example, direct potable reuse, indirect potable reuse, there definitely will be opportunities for collaboration between these two groups and, and we'll uh, evaluate that as that comes up. And I, I mentioned we would, sh we would show this again, um, or we, we would talk about this. So right now, we're in 2021. So in 2020, we started the RFP, I think it was around March. Uh, they started the work and um, we're back now in 2021 to present those results to, the, to, you, to you and we'll start implementation. Next year will be implementation and then again in 2023, we would plan to initiate the RFP for a rate study, presenting those re rate study results back to council in 2024. And with that, if you have, oh, if you have any other questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you, Ms. Hackett. Let's see if my colleagues have questions. I see Councilmember Richens going for the mic. Um, no questions, just a comment. Uh, part of our strategic plan, I think, towards the end of it was to develop into a high-functioning city. And I, I feel if I would have sat through this presentation five years ago, I wouldn't have saw this presentation. I would have just saw the, the audit report. And so to follow it up with short-term, mid-term, and long-term recommendations is impressive. Um, I, I just can't say enough good things about it, and kudos to all of you, and I think this puts you guys on the high-functioning city path. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Steiner. Thank you. Great job, Katie. And Tom, you're doing a good job, bud. Thank you. Um, Jacob, I just want to make sure that at the six-month mark, we're getting an update on if we accomplished our five recommendations uh, in the immediate ones, and then again a year from today, uh, letting us know if we accomplished all nine recommendations. And then just along the way, during the one- to three-year period, periodic updates on uh, the progress we're making. Absolutely. Thank you. 
Vice Mayor Speak. Thank you. Uh, Jim took all my all my questions. Those were great. Uh, uh, great presentation. Uh, very happy to see the not only the actions and actually see this divided into two presentations. Uh, very happy to, to see that that piece presented. And yeah, I, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, how we progress on each one of these issues and, and how they uh, affect us in the long term. But thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hockett. Um, I do have one question. Um, on slide 20, you had, uh, under resources, one to three a uh, year, uh, number six, evaluate the current outsourcing contracts to calculate the cost of administering them and the performance of contractors. Um, I was wondering, maybe this isn't necessarily a question for you, maybe it's for Mr. Ellis. Um, is this something that we just, have we not standardized this in our purchasing and contract renewal process mm -hmm. to have this like step of evaluating um, you know, our outsourced contracts? Like, because I see it here as a recommendation, which then makes me think, like, is this not a thing that we regularly do? Because if it isn't, I want it built in everywhere. So, um, Mayor, thanks for the question. Um, to the best of my knowledge, I would say that this is informally done on a regular basis by staff. As they work with contractors, they're always evaluating them and determining if, if they're doing a good job, if we have problems. Uh, we don't publicize it a lot, but in my time here, we have we have fired contractors and we've sent them letters that said this contract is terminated because we weren't happy with the service. But your question, I think, is really about a systematic way of going through those, and I don't think that that really exists. It's really largely a an informal function that staff are all doing to determine if they like the contractor, but I don't think we do have in place a systematic way to go through all of our contractors on a, on a particular regular basis, in part, I think, because... Contractors are coming and going all the time, right. um, but it's certainly good feedback and something we can look at. Yeah, I, I think that's something to consider. Um, and every department has different needs, but I could imagine some sort of like assessment rubric, right? When you're renewing contracts or just that could almost um, take the guessing work out of it and you can build off of. Anyway. I liked it. And thanks I for the it. feedback. <laughs> um, Ms. Hockett, thanks for the presentation. Um, thanks for the work you're doing. I appreciate this. We do look forward to seeing uh, this come back. Uh, Mr. Moody, thank you as well, and, and thank you, your whole team. Um, let's see if we have some questions, comments from the audience. Uh, Ms. Edwards, are there any speaker cards or written comments from the public on this item? Mayor, I do not have any written comments, but there is one speaker card. Okay. We can have the speaker. Hello. There we go. Good afternoon again. Um, I, I, I hate to be flippant about the whole thing, but I used some of the wrong pronouns. You said you went through a rate hike. Raf Tellis and the city went through a rate hike, and then the same people who did the rate hike who said at the rate hike meetings that their audits don't find anything and they're not worth doing, and, oh, it's a whole separate department, and then it turns out it's not a whole separate department that you consult with the people that did the rate hike. So that about half of the group, maybe 40%, were exactly the same people that participated in the rate hike process. So you should have said we went through a rate hike because it was the same people. Um, the lease arrangement uh, is pretty interesting. So there's, say, a field between Lincoln and the corporate yard that I believe DWP pays $500,000, a million for a field a year. So it's a, it's a systematic way of taking money out of DWP. Um, another way to do it is say you build a building, this DWP building, and then you move out a couple years later and it becomes a police department, you know, at some further expense. And then you build another DWP building and then that becomes the fire department. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of systematic looting that happens through this, through this process, not just the leases on the existing facilities, but through various other schemes. Uh, the, the 0.85 FTE thing to say that well that's actually what people work, that's what's claimed up front. But because nobody tracks it, I've had discussions with the previous finance people about it that they only account for their time when it's off of their home account. So if say you know you were Mr. Steiner a 0.85 FTE, but you did a whole bunch of stuff at the park or the plunge or you know some other general fund thing that unless you turned in a card that says that you work there 50% of the month, nobody's going to know. So if you didn't turn in and employees are told not to, not to report that, 
You know, they're not asked to report that, and there's no checks on it. So you can say it's 0.85, but it's not necessarily 0.85. That's that's what's that's what's decided and allocated up front. But because we don't track it, they said it right here. We don't track it, and it's sort of a voluntary tracking system. So, um, and the most obvious thing is maintenance service needs to be out of DWB. I mean, it just it's just another another way to kind of blend money and and sort of bleed it by a thousand cuts out of DWP. It should be in public works. You know, it is unusual. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be the way it is. So, thank you very much. Ms. Edwards, are there any other speaker cards or written comments for this item? Mayor, no, there are not. Okay, let's move on to our last item, which is discussion on upcoming downtown revitalization plan. And we have Ms. Jessica Gonzalez, Economic Development Director, who's going to introduce the item. Yes, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. So today we are pleased to provide you with an update on the upcoming downtown revitalization plan and key milestones and community engagement that will occur over the next 12 months. And so as you may recall, in April, the City Council selected Cosmon Companies and its sub-consultant Storyland Studios to support the city in this engagement. Both firms are here this afternoon. Looking forward to sharing that update with you, sort of a preview of the roadmap ahead, as well as their initial research. So I will turn it over to Larry Cosmont, who is the CEO of Cosmont Companies, to introduce his team and start the presentation. And I do believe, as a quick note, that our team is working on getting the file formatted for us. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you, Jessica. Larry Cosmont, Cosmont Companies, very pleased to be here, Madam Mayor, members of the council. We've enjoyed so far working with city staff. I think what you'll see today is a very important baseline presentation. I think we're all on a pretty interesting and unique journey in terms of downtown revitalization. The timing couldn't be uh, more interesting in terms of economic cycles. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, and. Uh, but you know, with challenges, there come opportunity, right? So we have to, I think, be proactive about that. So just by, thank you, uh, by, just by way of introduction, as I said, my name is Larry Cosmont. Cosmont Companies has been in business for 35 years, serving both the public and private sector. Our, our team, let's see if I can move this forward, is here tonight. Most of our team is here tonight. Uh, Ken Hira, our president, is sitting right behind me, and Brian Moncrief, our senior vice president. One of our analysts, vice president, Bob Valenti, is not here. We also have Peter McGowan, chief experience officer from Storyland. Cosmon and Storyland are teamed on this effort, as well as Art Cueto, uh, who is the architect development manager. Peter will be up in about a minute uh, to explain a bit about Storyland, then I'll come back and final and finish up the next segment of the presentation and let you know how we're organized for today. So just uh, by way of background, uh, some of us, some of you may know Cosmont. We've been in this business a very long time. Uh, we specialize in transactions. We're a very transactional uh, set of companies focusing on what we call the three-legged stool, real estate, economic development, and public finance. Um, we are not necessarily purely a study Firm. We really look toward implementation of projects. And I think that's the ultimate challenge here for downtown, is really to move toward a series of projects that recast the future of, the, of Corona. Uh, we have a full range of services that we provide, everything from economics to market analysis to fiscal impact. Uh, and our in-house team is also unique. We have financial advisors, we have economists, we have former real estate developers. I'm a former city manager and economic development director. So you get with us, I think, the understanding of private investment and public investment, and that is our hallmark. Peter, can I ask you to come on up for a storyline? Here we go. I will give you the storyline page. Thank you. Hi, I'm Peter McGowan. I'm a longtime Corona resident. I moved here in 1984. Uh, met my wife at Corona High School. She graduated our valedictorian in 91. I actually then went over to Centennial and graduated. But uh, we actually got to start our company here in Corona in 2001. Our actual main home office is here in Corona. Um, we actually are a little schizophrenic. We have two different names. You may have heard of us as Plain Joe Studios. Uh, that's been our brand for about 20 years. And over the last five years, we merged with another company, Down Lake Elsinore Storyland. Uh, so that's where the two names came from. But we've worked with a lot of uh, local brands over the years, Miguel's, Miguel's Jr., Crossroads Restoration Roasters. 
um, to just name a few. Uh, currently, we have uh, just over 100 employees on our team. We have offices uh, here in Southern California, as well as uh, uh, London, Hong Kong, as well as um, uh, in, in San Antonio, Texas, and Charlotte, I believe. Um, at the end of the day, we're an experienced design firm. Uh, we really focus on this idea of uh, communicating story. We help people tell their story using design. Uh, because of that, uh, we've actually, uh, our background comes very strongly from the theme entertainment world, uh, the Walt Disney Company here locally. Uh, we work with a lot of different companies from Universal uh, Studios, Lego, Mars, M&M's Candy, uh, as well as um, in the film industry. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Pinewood Studios. Uh, some of the largest blockbusters over the last 10 years have come out of there through uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and we're able to work with a, a lot of different uh, cities and companies uh, bring economic development in the entertainment business. Um, we offer a pretty wide range of services. It really rotates around these three kind of fundamental areas that we say is story that walks away with people, or traditionally known as kind of branding. A uh, story that doesn't walk away with people, we call it spatial storytelling. We actually are a licensed architectural firm. Uh, and then a uh, story that people interact with, and that gets into digital media. And we uh, do everything from web development to app development to uh, uh, mobile experiences and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, it really is all about understanding our customer story and how do we make sure that the design supports the story that uh, it, we want to bring through. And what I'm really excited about for the city of Corona um, is just really the history of it. Uh, I was uh, I was National History Day winner when I was in high school and a uh, big fan of just the Corona, the heritage within this city and being able to kind of bring that thread of continuity to life within this project. I'm really excited and humbled and blessed to be able to work with Cosmon on this. So thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Peter. I have to say, uh, you can see why we're so excited about this project. It is a combination of history and future that we are embarking upon. And as I said earlier, it's, uh, we are at a crossroads here is how to merge or in incentivize private investment by engaging in projects that can be productive for the community and work toward an economy that's shifting so quickly. This presentation is a good baseline presentation. You're going to see us back a number of times for sure. And we encourage the questions and any comments you have. I think the more we get to know each other's priorities, especially yours, of course, the better we will do at this. But the legs of this journey, at least for tonight, are one, to talk about the post-COVID digital economy and our approach to that, uh, which we think is clearly uh, you know, very in tune with the kinds of questions, the kinds of issues, the kinds of programs that you have to think about in an economy that's shifting so quickly. That's bolstered by the next section, which uh, Ken Hira will uh, present. I'll do the first section. And that'll talk about the corona market fundamentals. No matter what, even in a changing landscape, we still have to understand who we are, what we are. You have to look in the mirror and see what do we need to change at some level. So. That's, uh, Ken will cover that. And then finally, the pathway to downtown revitalization, some of the initial tools and strategies that we'll be looking to evaluate, looking and seeking to see how we can make it fit. Some of that could be part of a housing strategy, by the way. I thought Joanne's report was excellent. We want to talk about housing as an economic development tool. That section will be presented by uh, Brian Moncrief, our senior vice president. And uh, also, Peter will come back and support that presentation as well. So history, future, and the challenge. And the challenge is really about an economy that wants to change how it buys every good and service as quickly as it possibly can. And so it makes it hard for us who have been in the brick and mortar business to figure out what do you invest in when the patterns of consumption, the places of consumption, the levels of consumption are changing. No, no, make no mistake about it, we built these counties, we built these cities on consumer cons consumption, and yet the bet on consumption is changing dramatically. Our approach, just to look at this slide for a second, in terms of economic development, as we go through the metrics of evaluation for a downtown revitalization, is first to educate. I mean, and you'll see Ken will come up. It's the first step in a long journey, but analytics that make sense, market data that gives you a sense of a picture that gets you to a conclusion, project evaluations that see what pencil, what doesn't work, what's too expensive, what needs more investment, those kinds of evaluations are key. And of course, fiscal and economic impacts to the community. We not only have to gauge 
where the benefits will be in terms of a private sector transaction, but how that translates over to public policy and public investment return. In order to really better evaluate where we want to go, the engagement process is absolutely critical. And here, with Storyland in particular, will help Cosmon and the city engage the community in a series of hands-on workshops and also a digital outreach program. The combination of those two efforts will give this you know, great level of timing and, and immediacy, as well as long -term, a long-term commitment to a conversation about where the community can go in terms of its downtown revitalization pro uh, process. The education, the communication, is sets the path toward the most important part, which is execution. Uh, let me say this, that no matter what you would have invested in five years ago, and I know we've been down this road in Corona a bit, it might have been the wrong bet. I mean, today's a different world. So in a way, the very delay that we've experienced gives us a chance to reset with a much different set of, uh, of guideposts and a much different vision that's based on some shifts that we cannot escape. Right? We cannot escape. At this point, everyone can buy almost anything by pressing a button. So the question is, how do you engage them enough to go out and make that purchase or make their presence in a place that they want to get to? It's a different formula. Before we solve for parking, today we solve for trips. It's a much different shift. So the execution is going to reflect these trends. And so public-private partnerships, developer negotiations, revenue enhancement and preservation tools, all about the implementation. Those are the results. So just to you know, get into it a bit, as we view this um, pathway of investment that the private sector is looking at, that's where we have to start. Because if we want to engage in investment in Corona, if we want to have a successful downtown revitalization plan, if we want to have a community that's vibrant and resourceful and can commit to longevity, we have to figure out where the money is going. Now, whether or not we want to invite certain elements of that investment, like industrial, maybe not. But we have to also recognize that none of these factors, none of these investment groups, hotel, retail, office, residential, industrial, are the same that they were even five years ago. Office is totally sideways, and by the way, going in a suburban direction, not an urban direction. Different, different approach that Corona might take with it. Retail is certainly shifting. We know that it's shifting from brick and mortar to service and events, to food and other. It doesn't mean that retail as a brick and mortar fixture can't work. It just needs to be supported by other uses that are much more dynamic. Because to buy a good is not the necessity for a trip anymore. To get a service might be. To get educated certainly could be. right? But the trip itself, to buy a widget, really isn't the pure reason for a trip anymore. Hotel resetting, and I think also, frankly, going to come back in a significant way. Whether or not we can use hotel uh, as part of the mix is something we'll take a look at for a downtown revitalization plan. Residential whether we like density or don't like it, whether we appreciate or don't really appreciate the state's imposition through RENA, the truth of it is the private sector portfolio is being driven by residential values today. We see it in single family homes, we see it in multifamily. So the question for us is, is there a blend of the priorities of RENA, which may go toward affordable uh, product, but still casts a requirement for above you know, above mar market or above market, moderate or above market or market, those, that's the balance that we want to see because the residential is a driver in each one of these development performers that we're seeing in the marketplace. So it's a, it's a major consideration in any strategy uh, for downtown. And then industrial, of course, is shifting much more. Last minute delivery has brought uh, you know, into favor the valuation of industrial facilities and delivery, uh, in-town delivery facilities that are really there to augment the digital network. So life has changed. What we do with it is what's key. Part of it is how we look, as I say, at uh, the housing as a potential economic development strategy. And this is a big topic, but the reality is, is that housing is not just housing anymore. The housing that you will see developed in the future, to the extent that it's multifamily, will also be a bit of office. We'll also want to be next to walkable retail. We'll also want to be in the middle of service. And whether it's transit-oriented or not, 
the relationship between rooftops and commercial uses is much more integrated than it ever was. So we have to figure out where the opportunities are in the downtown revitalization area and figure out where we can blend the private motivation toward investing in housing toward the public policy motivation of Corona to shift to a, a series of vibrant commercial uses. They're gonna need each other. We're gonna find that balance because people work, shop, live, play in the same place these days. And so we're gonna have to find that. We're gonna have to look at opportunity sites that can accommodate that. And this next slide is really the one that is emblematic of what I'm saying. At one point in the world, we solve for retail by, big, by building big parking lots and big enclosed malls. And those are all refashioning. Storefront and anchor retails are receding. Service and entertainment are emerging. And we're seeing the reuse of parking lots. Now, whether they're large parking lots or small, whether they're the Corona Mall parking lot or a large regional center, the reality is, is to shift to a mix of uses that can coexist and do it in a way that would support private investment so that we could make the, get the benefit from that as a community and minimize our investment. But investment will be part of the program. And so you see underneath this uh, pictorial a number of tools that we use to engineer public and private investment in a coexisting way. One is to take your zoning and strategically place it in areas where that will induce private investment. So we call that development opportunity reserve. It's a, it's, it's a fix that is focused on capturing the density that you might give away by zoning, but putting it in a bucket and using residential density as a match for private investment. It's an enticement. That way you can engineer what you like in the, in the mix of those residential units, but you can also attract private investment with it. Tax increment districts will take a look at the ability to use uh, these new taxing districts called enhanced infrastructure financing districts, I call them value capture districts. That means we take the value of investment that we entice and we take the uptick in property tax and reinvest it in the area. And that's called tax or value capture tax increment financing. We can lock on and lock into developer contributions by creating ways for us to either capture the value through a development agreement, again, giving that density away in a development agreement and seeing if we can get long-term commitment for investment on that basis. And one thing we have been working on, which really doesn't affect each and every of the properties that we're looking at, is seeing where we have to vacate reciprocal easement agreements in, in existing shopping centers. Cosmont's working on a tool with the legislature to do that so we can take old centers and revitalize them by not being trapped by the underlying constraints that were legally imposed on the property years ago. So for us, in, in this journey with you, we're thinking that we can use these tools to reimagine Corona using the history and the future that we see. We've worked on it in many places. These are all cities and counties where we've uh, you know, worked on vibrant and historical downtown districts, whether it would be Santa Barbara or St. Elena or Sausalito. These are places that are not easy. They're small, they're vibrant, they're challenging, the community is very involved, and we've had some success. We've had a good measure of success. So moving forward, let's see if I can get this to click. Huh. There we go. What does it mean for you? And I'll, I'll, I'll summarize and introduce Ken so we can go to the metrics. But really, uh, to summarize, what I think is the beginning of a very vital journey is we have economic forces that are, we're trying to translate, and we think that the translation of those forces is really about diversification of land use. We have an opportunity in the public sector to trade off public amenities, to trade off housing for private investment that's going to bring the vibrancy that we need. The thing is to make the right bet, and the right bet is about identifying the right location, what we call opportunity sites, matching them with the right programs that induce private investment and also commit us to making investments where they're going to have the highest return for us as a community and to do it in a way that has longevity you know making an investment in big box retail today is not a great investment that's going away so we have to figure out which of the small retailers we can support what kind of restaurants can we get what kind of unique uses can we foster here can we use open space? 
as an amenity that attracts folks? Can we use special events, whether they be historical or cultural based? The point is, is that you've got to sort of be competitive with Netflix, and you need to get people out of the house. And so the dynamic between entertainment and retail and residential and amenities is truly the, the equation we have to unlock. Consumers, particularly millennials, have the ability to make choices, and they make them differently all the time. And so the mixed interactive components we're going to be looking at with StoryLens help I hope will we'll bring forward a concept, a set of concepts and a set of projects that make sense, starting with the Corona Mall. So we're going to be in the outreach business, we're going to be in the evaluation business, we're going to be in the metrics business, we're going to be in the investment business with you, and we hope, we know, that with enough work and a commitment on both our parts that we will conceive a strategy that can deliver a future it's not going to be easy lifting. We know that. You know that because you spent a lot of time searching for teams to help you. We are absolutely privileged and, and pleased to be here as part of your team. And we're very optimistic that if we work hard at this, we can. the timing is good for this kind of an approach and this kind of analysis. There may be some questions. If there are, I'd take them. But I do want to introduce, as soon as I can shift over to Ken Hira, our president of our consulting firm. He'll take the next leg of the presentation. Let's see if we have any questions for my colleagues. Sure. Questions on this first part? Not yet. OK. Great. Right. Thank you, Ken. Oh, there we go. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor and members of the council. Uh, it's really nice to be here in person without the, I didn't recognize um, Jessica because she didn't have one of those crazy things on. So it's a pleasure to be here in person and have this conversation we're very excited, as Larry mentioned, to be on your team, to be part of your team, to try to pursue a meaningful outcome for the downtown. The iconic locations that Larry showed on that slide are, are real examples. Uh, while we can make crazy comparisons between Sausalito and Santa Barbara and St. Helena and Corona, California, what's amazing about all those locations is they all raised their hand and said, we need help. And these are, you know, Santa Monica, Third Street. They all had the same question. Why are we facing such incredible change and how can we do something about it? So as part of that pie chart that we showed in the very beginning, the first step in our minds is education. We have to educate ourselves about your community and about what's going on in the downtown and the dynamics. We have to be educated about what's going on in the marketplace. And we have to then try to apply those on a strategic basis. So some of our very preliminary uh, findings, if you will, for existing conditions, and we're really getting into this analysis and this exercise, is we definitely see there's a need for greater place and community identity, obviously, in the downtown. You have identity in the downtown. But it has a tremendous opportunity to be a place that is attractive to folks from the inside and the outside. And that's one of our objectives, is to understand, how do we do that? There are definitely underutilized parcels and vacancies. I'll show you some trends in a second. Limited housing op options necessarily, retail entertainment based amenities that can accommodate sort of this younger population. I've got some demographics that we ran for you guys and we can look at those. But the idea is place and the comment about trips and destination and experience is what your downtown has an opportunity to be. Development will be challenging. It will require acquisitions and consolidation and public and private investment. Uh, the circulation. We think it's another critical piece to evaluate. The system needs to be improved, also needs to focus on walkability, connectivity. Uh, the downtown could benefit from some transit on the other side of the freeway that exists. And then, of course, we looked at key corona industries, including construction, manufacturing, healthcare, and retail. Frankly, you have a health and wellness district, if you will, with the hospital in, in, the, in the downtown environment. We looked at the specific plan, obviously, from a boundary perspective, and Brian, my colleague, will get into that in a minute. But you had draw into your downtown already. You know, frankly, we found that you have some daytime population coming in. More folks come in than leave, probably because of that health base and the job base. So we should leverage those strengths, if you will. And then um, we think increasing that residential and daytime population can be supportive of development, new development. And then, of course, public infrastructure. We alluded to that and the different tools that are available. But infrastructure will be needed as an investment uh, in the downtown to create the amenities, to create the proper infrastructure. 
uh, in order to support that additional development. So here's some very simple high-level metrics. You know, a relatively small population in the downtown at 7,400, a relatively uh, young age. I look very closely at median age when we look at different communities. Clearly, that 26.8 is lower than your overall population of the city. Uh, high Hispanic origin, average household income, relatively low, if you will, but you have folks coming into your downtown man, mainly to work. The good news there is that is some form of daytime population and attraction for jobs. We looked at the market metrics very quickly here. And you know you don't have a ton of retail. It's probably 10% of your overall retail. You clearly have brick and mortar retail that's generating a tremendous amount of sales tax revenue for your city. I'll show you some of that information in a minute. Uh, there's not very many multifamily units. It's a very small percentage, 500 of the overall uh, for your city, which is probably at 5% of the overall city number of multifamily units. There is a decent amount of office in that downtown uh, area, likely medical office. And then, of course, there's not much industrial to speak of because your downtown isn't really comprised of that type of DNA as a footprint. Now, you have other parts of your city, clearly, that have an industrial footprint that are going to make some sense because you've got tremendous demand for that type of last mile delivery, distribution, et cetera. It's just not germane necessarily to your downtown. And then the amount of hotel rooms that you have is, on, is relatively low. And, of course, the hotel industry for a while pre-COVID um, uh, was you know really on fire, if you will. There was huge demand for hospitality, uh, business, and leisure attraction. And that business is coming back. I was just on the phone today about reviving a hotel project, a couple of them, in fact. And we've even done some transactions that are related to hotel projects. So they're, they're trying to figure out how to wake up and reset uh, their industry. And I think there's opportunities there, potentially. A lot of information on this slide. But what this takes advantage of is artificial intelligence and mobile analytics. We've already analyzed for you. This is a picture of the folks that are coming into your downtown. Sorry, these are pictures of the people in your downtown, where they're going, what their preferences are. So if you, if you categorize them by shopping centers, groceries, and leisure, we picked a few categories. Where are people going from your downtown? Well, they're clearly going to a lot of places outside of the downtown. They're looking at grocery stores outside of the downtown. One of them is Cardenas Market. It's on the edge of that boundary. The city park gets definitely a lot of attention in your downtown, and it's there. It's attractive. Um, and then also the shopping center, Citrus Village, which is outside of that downtown, is getting a lot of attention. Well, because the Costco's and the Sam's Clubs and the Targets of the world and the home, and the home Depot's of the world are where folks are going to do a lot of that, that shopping. This pattern can change to the extent that the downtown offers, frankly, an experience. If the commodities are going to be purchased in those types of retail formats and brick and mortar formats, and a lot of it's going to go online, what will the downtown mean and be to the community and to the folks outside of it? It wants to be an experience. It wants to be a service. It wants to be a place. So this similarly, again, using mobile data analytics, and there's, there's a lot of information behind this, these are the folks that come into your town, into the downtown, where do they like to go? So we tried to monitor their preferences. Well, clearly the beach is a place they like to go. We can't do much about that. But they are going to the Van Buren Drive-In Theater, so they're looking for some form of entertainment in that case. Again, they're going to Corona Hills Plaza you know, to shop at some of, the, some of the big box retailers that are still around and clearly do a lot of grocery shopping outside of the downtown area. Another slide on data. Right, we said data is so important and analytics is important. This is the pie chart that you see there represents all cities in California. It's how general funds derive their revenues. So if you take three big categories, property tax, sales tax, and TOT, which is transient occupancy tax generated by hotels, all cities in California get about 41% of their general fund revenues from property tax. That's the biggest foundation of revenue. 22% from sales and 8% from hotels or that TOT. In the case of Corona, we, you can see I, I put some data in here that property tax is about 46%. So you're a little bit over the average, a very stable source of income, but the sales tax is at 37%. So what we do is we look at cities and we want to make sure that they're not either overweight or underweight in certain categories or to be conscious of where those revenues are coming from. Now, because you have big retailers, frankly, and thank goodness, they're still 
uh, successful in their formats, they continue to generate uh, you know, 37% of your revenue. So there's a lot of money you're relying upon on, on sales tax, and then relatively lower amounts on, on hotel, which is why I mentioned there could be some opportunities to drive and derive uh, general fund revenues from TOT. The scattergram, all those dots that you see on that slide, are every city um, plotted on a graph. And so you'll see some cities have incredible reliance on TOT, some incredible reliance on sales tax. Corona ends up being lower on the reliance on hotel tax and a little greater on sales tax, just comparatively speaking. So the data we're collecting, we want to try to use, be smart about it, have market intelligence, and then the next section here, Brian Moncrief is going to take on and really walk us through how do we get to um, the next steps and the downtown revitalization and a pathway to get there. For a moment, I'll take any questions if you've got any on what I've presented. If not, I can hand it over to Brian. I have, I have one real quick. Sure. I'm, I'm just wondering what the methodology was for collecting that data on where our residents' destinations and where our visitors is, is at. Credit card usage, or it's actually mobile data analytics. So uh, there's a company called called Placer AI. Uh -huh. It knows I'm here, right? It know th this knows. I hate to say it, Placer knows, and I'm giving a city council presentation tonight. Uh -huh. <laughs> it, yeah, big brother. And tomorrow, it's going to know that I'm giving a city council presentation in a different city in Laguna Hills. Gotcha. So the shopping trip, the time at home, the time at work the time in the commute, where I go, how I go, when I go, and for how long I'm uh, occupying a space with this in my pocket provides all that information. I guess it Sorry. gives you accurate data. It's just a little creepy, but... Okay. It, it, it is a little creepy. We put a footnote down there that this information may be creepy, so you know, okay. everybody sit down before we present it. Placer AI is a source, and where we've been really leveraging. I want to make one other comment that historically we looked at sales tax as leakage, and we used a lot of more we used traditional data sources, Bureau of Labor Statistics, et cetera. At, 20, on, at 2017, we could take a picture, if you will, and see where sales tax was going. And you got a sense of it. It's going from one city to the next. It's going from one shopping center to the next. As Amazon has created its incredible effect, not at 2017, much earlier than that, the trend is clearly that you can't really predict where those sales are leaking to other than say they're going to internet sales. And then what's happening is it's creating greater emphasis as well. You talk about sales tax revenues on the county pools and how those dollars come back into city coffers. So we're in the middle of a pretty dramatic change, but this mobile data uh, analytics should be smart market intelligence, real-time market intelligence to help us evaluate the opportunities in downtown Corona. Thank you. Do my colleagues have questions on the section? No? Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Brian. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. Appreciate the opportunity. I will mention, just before I, I move forward to my slides, is that What's interesting about this and what we'll see as we go through this process is that this is just a snapshot in time, right? So pre-COVID, post-COVID, we're going to be looking at the data and analytics to see if that changes fundamentally or if those big shopping centers where you have, you know, large big box retailers like your Walmarts and others are still kind of usurping all of the, you know, activity. So I just wanted to mention that before we move forward. So as Ken and um, Larry alluded to, I mean, I think this is an exciting time for the city, right? We are, there's a unique opportunity here to look at public and private investment, specific opportunity areas and sites um, to create a sense of place. And so, you know, supporting whether it's projects or areas or sites are going to be critical and key as sort of we look at, form, you know, formation of a plan in the future. It goes without saying, though, that you know the vision and goals at the very front of this process is going to be important. City, stakeholder outreach, council outreach, collaborating with city departments are going to be critical to making sure that we have a firm vision and goals leading us forward as we go through the rest of this process. Also, what's going to be critically important is understanding the real estate market. Ken went into that a little bit. We're going to dive into it more as this process plays out. but. 
what that data tells us about the future of downtown Corona and what we can surmise from that is going to be important. Identifying opportunity areas and sites that we can leverage, whether it's catalyst site opportunities, it could be the Corona Mall, it could be City Hall campus, it could be the medical district area as we're calling it, will be important to focus on as well as others as we go forward. Land uses as Ken and Larry alluded to are changing dramatically. And so looking at creative economic development tools that could be used um, in tandem with, you know, these and support of these sites and areas are gonna be important as well. And then five and six on our process and plan is really about coming up with strategic approaches, collaborating with the city to do that, and implementation and coming up with an action plan to create meaningful results at the end of the day for your downtown. As I said earlier, there's a distinct opportunity or a unique opportunity, as I would call it, to invest in specialized infrastructure, identify key areas and sites, some of which are identified on this map today. This is really a preliminary assessment of your strategic institutions and anchors in your downtown, that being the mall, the downtown medical district, and the growth of that area, as well as the City Hall campus, where you can look at focusing on you know, strategic infrastructure improvements as it relates to expanding public programming and you know, creating sort of an opportunity for residents to come and, and create an experience for them. I will say that the boundary of this area is not set in stone by any means. We use the downtown specific plan as sort of a first pass. So all the data, all the analytics, the real estate market information you see today is based on the boundaries that are shown on this slide. As we go forward, it may make sense to look at you know a more refined boundary that's closer to what we would call a downtown and is not sort of a long corridor along Lincoln. Maybe it's the boundaries of the, of the circle itself. We'll, we'll explore that as we go forward, but I just want to make sure that it's clear that this, these are not by any means sort of the solidified boundaries that we're looking at as it relates to the downtown. As we get more market and analytics, I think it'll help us um, actually you know, evaluate that better. So as we've talked about throughout this presentation, there are strategic tools that cities, we call chips or maybe currencies, if you will, that cities can use to leverage to support downtown revitalization. There's already a strong foundation in your downtown as it exists today, but cities can use zoning for capturing new density and doling it out you know, in, in exchange for pre-approved community benefits. Cities can use entitlements via expedited processing or locking in public and private benefits as, uh, as it relates to a development agreement or disposition and development agreement. Cities can use special districts like enhanced infrastructure financing districts to capture value from development and use that value in currency to invest in sp specific infrastructure improvements. And given the low rate environment as it is today, you know, at least currently as we sit here today, you guys can leverage and create greater capacity as it results to you know, freeing up funds in your general fund. The city's already embarking on that with the leadership of the city manager as it relates to the pension obligation bonds you guys are currently exploring. Outreach, engagement, and visioning, obviously a critical component. We've discussed it a lot today in this presentation, but it's twofold. It's really what we call the air game, which is a digital approach to outreach, making sure that we can reach folks on their cell phone as well as traditionally in person. So that's digital and in-person outreach, that's Spanish and English outreach because we know such a large percentage of the community is Hispanic and making sure we're sensitive to that. All of these are going to be important approaches to maximizing and expanding our reach to the community to make sure we get the input that we need that's meaningful and that can you know, feed into our overall plan and our action plan and implementation approaches that we suggest at the end of this process. So I'm going to pass it over now to uh, Peter McGowan to talk a little bit about the digital outreach component as well as the design guidelines. All right. Uh, the way that we approach the goals is actually it's a, uh, a pretty collaborative way that we look at it. Um, we divide it up into these two primary uh, areas on the top. Uh, a lot of times we'll say it's the reaching out to the external audience or positioning towards that target audience. 
and really trying to understand how to get uh, a diverse stakeholder input. Uh, and we do everything from focus groups with residents to different community organizations, business owners, and property owners to get their input and make sure that as we're shaping the story, we really are addressing those outside the organization. And the second way to look at it is uh, what we say is the internal stakeholders a lot of times. Um, and, and really it is a key thing as working with the key internal people uh, who uh, we want to be able to encourage to participate in the projects and collaborate with them as we really work out the, the story and the unique vision for this downtown experience. We do this through a process that is actually kind of birthed out of the Walt Disney Company called the Blue Sky Process. I don't know if you guys are familiar with how Disneyland was master planned over a weekend. They call it the Lost Weekend. But it really is this idea of a pressure cooker of time that the most important things rise to the top. And we actually are able to cull uh, the, the key things and actually help uh, define a big idea. And then that big idea will help uh, drive decisions as well as uh, uh, design direction as we move forward. From that point, we'll actually move into more tactical steps, uh, developing a site map, uh, a website for people to actually get uh, the core of the information, making sure that as they navigate through it, they find the kind of the breadcrumbs that we want to leave for them, but then also if they want to dive deeper that they can find uh, uh, the information that they're looking for and also uh, gain feedback through that interaction. And that really becomes the framework in which we would launch any sort of social media campaigns uh, or things that are shared uh, that delve back into the, the traditional website uh, par, um, segment. And then we also would team up with different uh, partnerships uh, throughout the social media process, whether it's partnerships with formal organizations like Facebook or Instagram or anything like that, but then even uh, social media groups uh, that are uh, you know, more uh, grassroots efforts like the Citizen for Corona or anything like that. Um, as we look at the, the design guidelines, uh, we have an extensive uh, experience over the last 20 years really kind of developing different uh, what we say is uh, signage systems or design wayfinding systems, graphics that help people find their way. And a lot of it ties back into that, uh, that scripted experience that people will have as they interact with space. Um, uh, we, we do that through a pretty disciplined approach, starting with just research uh, and doing that discovery and collecting information, understanding that uh, how we can find people and how they're going to find their way. I think uh, not to creep you out with the digital side of things, but there's a whole digital frontier in helping people find their way as well. Um, uh, doing fo uh, stakeholder focus groups, making sure that we're on track with a lot of the assumptions we made throughout the beginning of the design process. And then working with uh, community workshops and visioning exercises so that we can make sure that the, the process in which we're telling the story makes sense, especially to locals, and then translates to the outsiders. Uh, and then from there, we're able to develop the final design guidelines that we would move forward with. Does that make sense? Do you have any questions for me while I talk about that? It doesn't look like there's specific questions. I'm sure we have some thoughts at the end, though. All right. All right. Yeah, we'll wait. I'll hand it back to my colleague. Thank you, Peter. So just to wrap up uh, the presentation, this is the sort of high-level overview of the timeline of, the, of events related to the process and the project. We've obviously kicked off the project in April. It's a 12-month process. We are in the process right now of doing due diligence, looking at the existing conditions, the real estate market, and so on. We will be starting stakeholder engagement, and I'll show you that timing in the next slide here, throughout the process digitally and in person, as well as check-ins periodically with the council and city staff to make sure we're on track. And then the Storyland Studios team will be working on placemaking, wayfinding guidelines, and then the downtown plan obviously will be a collaborative effort. The immediate next steps, or I would say kind of program for the rest of this year, 2021, um, I already mentioned we're in due diligence right now. We're going to be setting up stakeholder group discussions. Those are more focus group discussions where we have a list of folks. It could be the Chamber of Commerce. It could be other important groups, stakeholders in downtown that we want to sit down and meet with. Um, that's going to happen, we anticipate, in August, September of this year. We're going to be launching our website in tandem with the first in-person community workshop in October, November. We're going to come back to the council just to give you guys an update on what's occurred, what we found out, what we're starting to hear as it relates to the workshops or as it relates to the research and analysis we're doing. And then we're going to be working on sort of initial draft design guidelines as well as the downtown plan for kind of city internal review in December, January. 
So that concludes the presentation. Both teams are here to answer any questions you may have, and I really appreciate your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's, uh, let's bring it back to Vice Mayor Speak. Go ahead, you picked up the mic first. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I was uh, lucky enough, I think it was probably two or three years ago, to hear uh, Mr. Hira present in this room about um, how retail changed and retail is changing and the need to be more you know, entertainment based and, and that was going to be a focus and it certainly has come true that way. Unfortunately, we haven't taken any steps to, to you know, make any, any crossroads uh, come to bear to, to make a change. Um, so I wanted to make sure that's still, that's still a valid, uh, so you did protective future, good job, Ken. Um, you, you made a big, uh, a big point about zoning and, and I, I look at the, zone, the downtown zoning and especially around the mall area and a few other places, it's pretty wide open. So I'm a little bit confused that does it need to be more wide open than it already is or are we talking about making it more restrictive? Um, we, we changing view, it? Yeah, we, changing it maybe. We view zoning as opportunistic. I think once we understand what the strike of balance would be as uses, let's say we're looking for a food center, or, you know, something that is, you know, food and entertainment oriented. And let's say we could support that with a certain amount of density uh, that might be beyond that specific zone. What we'd look to do is to manuscript the density to the adjacent use and see if we could make that work. So we just view it as, as an opportunity to um, sort of adjust uh, or motivate the economics on a particular project. So, so are you familiar with the zoning that we have have downtown? Because it seems, I mean, the way I read it, literally, you could almost do anything. It's fungible. You could do almost anything. Okay, correct. Right, great. I want to make sure I still understood that and there was, wasn't a misunderstanding. No. Um, uh, I mean, I kind of see the the downtown area that our biggest issue is this you know, 20 years of, of uh, lack of deferred, ma deferred maintenance that we haven't done. And we have a lot of issues that kind of need to happen. You know, our streetscape, sidewalks, um, we talked about traffic calming at one point a few years ago that I thought was a, a great idea. Street parking, you know, city park is a good big focus for us for next year um, and will be for a while. I, I, I thought I saw um, Dr. Turner, but she, she left. But um, the Historic Civic Center, it's a, it's a big focus for us. And, and I see those things as being really, I think, until we kind of handle that part, doing the rest, I mean, what's, what's, the, what's the plan to handle, handle that? And, and, and get those taken care of so we can look at these other things. Um, and that's probably then a question for you more for, more for staff and how that relates to this program. Um, and then I, I look at the, the downtown, uh, the key sites and areas, and we call out three areas, uh, this, the, the City Hall campus area, which I understand from a, a point of view that we want to spend some time making sure that we take care of, but it, it, it almost seems like there could be other areas that would that would uh, create a bigger bang for the buck. So, or at least uh, a better. I mean, not that I don't want this area to be to be successful. It just seems like wouldn't we want to build upon, um, you know, the the medical district that we built that it's yeah. it's got great momentum. It seems to be. I mean, even the numbers are kind of playing that out. And then um, currently with the mall. Even though um, the lab is is you know close to the finish line here and, and getting their their stuff going along, it seems like it would be more beneficial from a, um, a uh, momentum standpoint to kind of move those key areas more in the center of downtown to see us expand upon those and 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 deal with those deferred maintenance issues and the issues on on Sixth Street. Yeah, just if I could address that for a minute, I think the objective, I think you're right. You, I agree with you 100%. I think part of it as we go through this process is going to figure out how we prioritize those sites. What are the key sort of needs for each of those to help support sort of invest on an investment basis, public and private? Could be a public-private partnership. It could be some other type of you know mechanism that might make sense to help affect change. So we're, we're by no means limited to those. I think we'll identify more as we go through this process, but those are more like key sort of anchor institutions that sort of, you know, are rooted in your downtown that need some attention. Because our, our, I mean, the current um, 3P project we have right now is the mall. I mean, it's been a, it's been a, a, a project and a, and a focus for us for the last few years. And, 
and I'm happy to see it be a key area. And I want to make sure that that uh, what is planned and what is you know we've been all pushing for uh, it gets across the finish line, and this doesn't distract from it. Or or frankly, you know they're not even here, so I'm not sure. Um, you know, I want to make sure that that we're still all in with with uh, these folks to make sure that that uh, we're going to help push it across the finish line. We are collaborating with them. They are part of this process. We've already had all three groups together, both staff, Cosmont, as well as lab talking together. So we're very much coordinating that. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks to hear that. I, and lastly, I, I, you know, we we mentioned you mentioned North uh, North Maine a little bit, and I can tell you, um, uh, probably a. A hundred percent certainty, or ninety-nine point nine percent certainty, no one wants what happened with North Maine to happen again. Um, this it was a, a a plan, like you said, that that was done years ago. That that a never finished, um, and frankly, you know, the city of Corona has several of these locations, including the mall. The mall never became what it was supposed to become. The plan was a, a good plan; it just didn't have great execution. And I want to make sure that that. You know, I think you made a good point about um, refining these areas and really building upon the the you know maybe we shrink this, maybe we change this based on on what those momentum, what the momentum that we have right now and capitalize to ensure that we have a full project and not something that's supposed to be a catalyst for something else and then we kind of wait to see if another developer shows up to to do it. And the problem is is that we've had another developer show up and want to do something completely different, which is. You know, everybody that comes to Corona that I know, they tell me, you know, seven. You know, there's like seven different Coronas. It's like, which which one are you going to be? And I know that's one of our our strategic goals is is to come up with a, a brand and identity and and I, and I want to see it in this plan. I mean, it's really this is, and I think the mayor said it many many times. Your heart and soul is your downtown, and and we don't we, we have one. And I, I don't want to say that as a as a slam to anybody who who lives downtown and enjoys downtown or does business downtown. And thank you for saying that that people come here and to do business. And we have an in, influx of people that are already coming here, and we want to make sure that we build upon that. Um, so I guess there's a question there somewhere, but we'll we'll find out. Um, I guess we'll yeah we'll find out there. Uh, and I think uh, as for the. The boundaries of the mall. I actually think the opportunity or the key area is bigger than what it shows there. Um, you look at, I mean, talk about open land and having an opportunity. The areas um, that are west of uh, of the mall now that are that are open. I know that there's maybe folks who are interested in doing something there. It would be fantastic to see that stuff tied in because I think there's an opportunity to, like I said, momentum and uh, to to bring. So I want to make sure that that. Uh, frankly, I think that opportunity area for the mall really needs to be a little bit, a little bit wider. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Steiner. One thing about that, we really will focus on figuring out where the opportunity we call them opportunity sites are. You know, and that can be an existing site that has some property developed, or it could be a more of a greenfield site. But it has to do with you know market demand, adjacency, infrastructure, all of those pieces including the interest of private investment for a certain kind of use or multiple uses. So we are looking for opportunity sites because we can't get momentum without the private side. So we have to figure out where the hook is. Yeah. Council Member Steiner. Thank you, Mayor. Wes, you said everything I was going to say. You stole my thunder. <laughs> Actually, I wasn't going to say any of that. Um, and I saw, um, I saw Tom... Tom got a little excited when you started talking about history, so I'll leave that to him. I just want to thank you for your presentation. It was very impressive. Um, I'm very thankful to have your expertise and experience uh, and of your team uh, joining, joining our team. So it's awesome. Thank you. Councilmember Richens. Love Wes, love Steiner. Um, I, I, I did get excited with the history, and I, and I really like the tagline, history, future, and a challenge. I, I thought that was genius. And I, I'm probably the one council member that jokes around the most, but for I'd like to be more serious than normal and ask some pretty key questions. Um, over where they're building the City of Hope, there's a tire store, and that tire store is successful. So I don't know that that tire, it's, it's a great tire store, I'm sure, but it's probably not a store that you want in your downtown revitalization area. 
So how do you take a store that's successful and put them out of business or move them to another location in the name of downtown revitalization? How do you make that change? I know the, I know the tire store. Um, you know, you're going to have existing uses that are working quite well that are not compatible, let's say, with where you want to go. Um, I don't know that you have to fix those first. I think that you know you have to take a balance of where you can get success and change an image and then enable a private sector use to see that there's a higher and better use than a tire store. Um, but right now, the comparison is for that site, that's the highest and best use right now based on where the dynamics of the activity are. So we've got to change the course of certain other sites and get some critical mass going elsewhere for people to, for investors and developers to look around and say, you know what, I think that it's time to move this use. The other alternative is you take a use on and you try and acquire it and relocate it. I can think of a couple of opportunities that stare at me that could be a fundamental building block, you know, even on the Corona Mall itself, that present a use that's antithetical to where that mall wants to go. That may be a place where we have to find a way to acquire and relocate. And there are some tools that we'll introduce to do that. But my point is you got to pick and choose those parcels very carefully because those are not easy to get done. They always come with a lot of anguish. Um, and they really need to have a purpose. You need to be able to say that the investment momentum in changing a use or acquiring a business or relocating it is worth the pain and anguish of doing it because you absolutely know that you're going to replace it with a better answer. So that's, that's a strategy that we'll come back to you on. And it's a, it's a strategy, frankly, that is sometimes when we look at it and we identify certain properties that should in our view, be acquired or know that they're going to be an obstacle that presents 20 years of sideway motion uh, in a key location. And we recognize that we're willing to leave it as a community. But that's a conversation we're probably going to have to have. And some of it, because it's a specific property, is going to have to be in closed session. I mean, that's part. That's how these go, go down. All right. We're getting rid of the tire store in closed session. Love it. Um, I don't even joke about that right now. <laughs> I'm like, you know, uh, Riverside, when they were doing their downtown, um, they still struggle with some businesses in the area that have were used before they invested in their downtown road, and they can't get rid of them. Um, there's no way of, of, of getting rid of it. All right, we're not getting rid of the tire store in closed session. Um, and there will be no joking. <laughs> um, it, as a kid, I, I used to go to, I'm not in the shape now, but I used to love surfing in Huntington Beach. And we would go to Huntington Beach, and they would have this beautiful wood pier and these beautiful wood shops. And these dinglings came in and, and just ripped it all out and put in all these stucco buildings and a concrete pier and took all the heart out of that thing. I, I do have fears that we're going to turn into Orange County and remodel in a stucco way. Do we, do we have to subscribe to that, or can we get away from that? So I think you get away from that because the, what we find, in, especially in this generation of millennial and Generation Z buyers, which is who we're going to be promoting this, these results to because they'll be our engaged audience, is authenticity is one of the great attractors for this generation. Authentic places, authentic spaces, both open and enclo enclosed and open. You know, it's just that's sort of a preference. When you do those commuter, when you do those consumer surveys, you find that authenticity, authenticity is a key element to attracting an audience. And so I think that you start with a great beginning here. I mean, why would you, why would you do waste away that wooden pier uh, in place for something that's just not going to be as authentic and not as attractive? Thank you. And then. Um from watching freeways be built in this city for the last however many years, they they build half the plans. And I do not want to build a half a plan. I, I don't want to be apologizing that we wasted the taxpayers' money and time. I, I really, really want to stay on focus on a full plan and, and stick to that. And, and at the end of the journey, there's a success, and people say, yeah, our city knocked it out of the park, not we need to find more money to fix a mistake kind of a thing. So 
I guess that's more of a comment than a question. I would like to uh, leave you guys with a challenge. Um, since you guys focus on Disneyland so much, I too am a fan of Disneyland. And uh, for some of you, you're going to know this. They, my wife's an architect, so I get schooled on this as well. Disneyland is probably the biggest community that focuses on forced perspectives. And if you know what I mean, when you walk into the park, it looks big. And when you walk out of the park, it looks small, right? That's forced perspective. And they design that way. The second story is a different scale than the first story and so forth and so on. I really feel that our downtown revitalization, if done smartly, could value from forced perspective. And I hope you guys will explore all that. And then last but not least, and this is more of a statement than anything, I love this city. I've committed to raise my family in this city and I'll live and die in this city. And I have a lot of fear about this downtown revitalization, a ton of fear. It scares me, but I'm willing to be vulnerable and I'm willing to advocate for it and I'm willing to knock the doors and push it. So you guys better do us right because it, it's my reputation on the line and I'll own it if it's a failure and I'll own it if it's a success. So make it a success. And that's my comments, Mayor. Okay, Councilmember D'Addario. Thank you, Mayor. I, I was um, listening intently when you were talking about the uh, the land use revolution, especially around hotels. Somebody that grew up in Anaheim and has seen the um, the uh, the all out just you know. Um, total reliance on the on Disneyland and the hotels and then especially over the last you know 18 months during covid what's happened to those hotels so when when i hear about um, you know rebounding especially in the hotels i pay you know particular attention on the west end of 6th street where we have the majority of our hotels and and i and i'm i'm not much of a history nerd like these guys but i'm a, a i really like um, the signs. So I've seen some of the names of the hotels, and they've and they've got the neon, and and I I personally can envision boutique hotels. I I have no idea why, but I, I personally can envision something like that. I don't know how far you guys are looking down um, into this revitalization area, if that extends into those hotels. But those are really the only local hotels that would be able to serve the downtown area. <clears throat> Excuse me, area. So I'm I'm interested to see what you guys come up with there. And then, you know, to be perfectly honest, I would have never um, <clears throat> acknowledged or come up with the fact that our our um, uh, healthcare area is is an area of focus. But I mean, it makes a lot of sense. I'm I'm really interested to hear what you guys come up with that. I'm also kind of saddened to hear that I'm apparently I'm a retail dinosaur <laughs> because I actually like to go to stores and look at things, <laughs> and touch them, and and figure out if that's what I want rather than ordering online. My wife is the complete opposite. So if in somewhere you could figure out a way for us to have one of those stores where you could just return Amazon items, that would be great. <laughs> bet you that'd be the Colts. most. You can yeah, do it return my Yeah, I bet you that'd be the most traffic store. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm interested to, to see about that. And, and I was listening to the other comments from my other um, colleagues and, and uh, I, I know that we're not there yet as far as you know the, the plan, but as far as the kickoff and, and doing the uh, due diligence and conditions, there are things in here that I, that I was reading about that I just never would have thought of. So I think that you guys are on a great trajectory, and I'm looking forward to seeing what we uh, come up with in the, uh, in the later months. So not really a question, but just a couple statements. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council yeah. Member. Madam right. Mayor, if I could just mm -hmm. say one thing. I think... Because I'm, I'm, the the potential for change here is, is phenomenal. But the um, you know when I was in my early 30s, I was the director of community development at Burbank, and at that time, there was a guy named Johnny Carson who used to call Burbank beautiful downtown Burbank, and it was tongue in cheek because there was nothing beautiful about downtown Burbank, nothing. And when I became the redevelopment community development director, average leases were 30 cents a square foot, and there were a bunch of used bookstores on that. Third Street Promenade, or the San, excuse me, on San Fernando Mall. And so 40 years later, downtown Burbank is awesome, and it's getting better all the time. And the reason I bring that up is because we can get the change, but to your point, Mr. Council Member, it takes time. I mean, success 
you know, we can unfold success and pick the right pathway, and, and maybe in five years you start to detect what that can be, but the story gets probably judged and rated and, and evaluated even beyond that, and I just wanted to point It's that 20 out. years, right? It's this 20 is a 20-year plan. 20-year plan. Don't mislead anybody. Correct. And sorry to cut you guys off. Um, please keep adding all the historical elements. I would be remiss if I don't say that. I... Jessica knows I bark down her door every day with, and I think I sent a 200-page document on historical elements. You all got it, right? Okay, thank you. Sorry. One other comment I just wanted to make. The, the medical district is key for corona, in our view. I mean, it is a trip generator, and it will be more and more of a trip generator as the medical uses get diversified there. So that's one anchor that is truly proximate to the Corona Mall, that truly has some promise for engendering trips like no other use that we can think of. So I think it's those the future of medical, the future of retail, the future of entertainment, the future of residential kind of hang together in that, in that zone, Whatever, however we redefine that zone based on opportunities. But that's somewhere in there, there's an equation that has to work. I'm so glad you mentioned about um, expectations because my very first question was to try and bring this back and bring some, uh, you know, keep some measured expectation. Um, you know, this plan does not guarantee success. Can you speak to where this has not worked? Have you had, have you worked on redevelopment plans in cities and have they not picked up and what were the downfalls? Well, there are, yes. And it happens as much as the success. Why? Because we can't control an economic cycle. We just saw that. Um, you know, had we made an investment in absolute retail three or four years ago, we were looking at what COVID does to that retail today, we'd be relooking at that investment. That's without a doubt. Look at every regional center that's going through that. So the point is, is that the chance for being sideswiped by an economic trend by a significant event, whether it's economic or physical, they just exist. I mean, the, the key is, is at the front end of this to figure out which elements make sense to push forward and in what balance and in what sequence. Someone talked about infrastructure. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be invested in down there in, the, in that whole region that we're going to look at. The question is, where do you get your biggest bang for that investment, and how do you tie it to private investment? So the timing and the type of infrastructure is key. It's not just infrastructure. It's specifically where can we put it so that it works to maximize what we want to get done. But the, your point and your question is that you can. there's a lot of ways to fail. You can put the infrastructure in the wrong place. You can misread the market. The market can turn on you and sideswipe you for five or six years, whether it's inflation that we may be facing. I mean, we're looking at an economy that's going to have employment and supply issues for at least the next year. And the question is, at the end of that, where do we end up? Do we end up in a heated economy where loans become too expensive? Or are we able to continue to buy down the interest rates so that at the time when we're looking to induce investment, we still have that momentum? So there's a lot of ways you miss. I'm just... The key is to do it as best as you can with the right kind of team. I can tell you, just from the commitment I see you here, I've been doing this a long time, you have the right vision and commitment. You have a good team around you. We just have to go to work, we have to get a little lucky, and we have to be very smart. Sure, and I can appreciate the uncontrollable factors, and that's just a risk you take. A risk you take. It's a risk that as a council you decide is well worth taking because the payoff is we finally get a a designated downtown that our city and our residents deserve. Um, but I'm asking specifically, can you think of any examples of controllable things yeah. that a city can go wrong or that a plan can go wrong? Yeah, sure. Has that happened in your experience? Can yes. You identify those Without things? identifying specific communities, there have been places where it seemed to us that the right mix called for a level of density which was not acceptable to the community. In other words, and, and, and I, I, I can tell you that there are a number of beach communities that get there pretty quickly, but there are some communities that aren't beach communities that get there. So if the personality of the community is that they never want to entertain sort of R4, R5 type density, and that's what they need to, to knock off, wipe the slate clean and reinvest in a much more 
you know, uh, in, in a much more dynamic way, well, that's a decision you make. I've been in closed session where a decision, when I've asked the question, wow, when we had this discussion four years ago, you all really wanted to do this. And now you're making a decision that will not let that happen because the economics are calling for a solution that you find not palatable. That's no, not a judgment. So glad, no, no, but I'm so glad you bring that up because we literally just had a presentation on our density and literally just spoke about how we did not want residential on our 6th Street. But if our plan comes up and says that we need mixed use or if we want a downtown revitalization, we need you know X, Y, and Z. I'm, I'm not quoting you. Just There was a conversation about where we want residential and where we don't. Is that accurate? Right. Actually, my... my my statement was not that I didn't want it on 6th Street. I wanted there to be a buffer. Buffer. Okay. Yeah. So not that I didn't want it on 6th Street. That there would be a buffer. Okay. There's a difference. So, so we need to know. We, we should make a mental note that the plan comes back and there's elements that are controllable, and that's our decision-making of whether or not we're going to implement the tools that are recommended. Right. And some of that will require you know, changing or discussing whether or not we're comfortable with some big changes. A policy judgment call, absolutely right. So a couple of other questions. Um, we just went through a, a strategic plan, and we had, um, it was a long process, of a year-long process. We had a lot of community engagement. There's a lot of good stuff that came out of there. Have you all read that, or have you reviewed the conclusions of it for our vision and our? Starting to. I, I can't say that I've spent a lot enough time on it. Some. I mean, there's a lot to get our arms around. I've been really focusing, I think, on the physical logistics of these three sort of key areas because I'm really at this point our team is trying to figure out just what you're asking about what's what's the right direction to go in beyond just the data right well I just think that there's a, there's a lot there probably we'll take we a look for sure um, and so then another on slide 15 you had the demographics of the downtown corona residents um, and we see the average income is actually is 52,000 and you know if 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 our downtown really changes and becomes this higher end area. Is there a built in step in this plan process where we think about what is the impact of the current residents and you know, do they get squeezed out? How do we how do we account for that in this plan? So the flip side in a way of the density discussion is the gentrification discussion. Um, it goes part and parcel. It's that's a big conversation, you know, with density and amenities comes some level of gentrification. So the key is where are you putting the density, what level of amenity package are you putting in, and what else are you doing? If you look at the plan that you saw tonight, you know, a good 46% of the units in the arena are, afford you know, are affordable. So that's an important part of the housing in question. 54% of your 6,088 or whatever that number is, by the way, is a market or above market. And so there is, and when you look at the median income, there is, you know, a quick answer that says you want to insert a bunch of units that are higher income units in this area in order to elevate some of the uses and then maybe motivate a different use in the tire store. But you also have to deal, on the flip side of that, with what you have and what that gentrification is. That's the discussion. Okay. And there is a part in this plan where we will be having that discussion? Yes, not okay. yet, but soon. <laughs> All right, my last question is, can we use that creepy data to engage our residents? <laughs> is there a way? <laughs> you know, just to try and get um, a good sample size and ensure that we're, we're hearing from everyone through this process. The short answer is yes. Okay. We can use that data in so many different ways, and frankly, to be productive and intelligent okay. about the market. Good. We showed well, you just a little bit of the creepy data, but there's a lot more to it. Wonderful. OK, I think I've got some another question yeah. from my council I got, member. I got one question. It was the creepy question. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, council member. Mayor, you, you bring up a, a good point about, the, about what the demographics in the area um, what that does if we, I don't know if this is going to be a super high end or, or what, we, what we decide to do, but any in, increase in, in uh, value, I mean, would also benefit as far as, the, you know, homeowners and whatnot. So I, I, I guess my next question is, is have we looked at or are we planning on looking at how many homeowner occupies or homeowners that are occupying their own residences within that downtown area? Can we get that data and how many are rentals? 
and seeing really if the the people that are going to be down there are going to benefit more than they're going to be impacted. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But part of the demographic and real estate market data we're going to look at is to figure out who's the customer down there, what's the demographics down there, what is it ownership versus rental, all of that plays into our overall strategy and approach. So yeah, we'll be looking at that data to answer your question. All right, let's see if we have some uh, questions or comments from the public. Ms. Edwards, are there any speaker cards or written comments from the public on this item? Mayor, I don't have any written comments, but I do have a resident coming with the speaker card. All right. Uh, I think that situation downtown is, you know, as somebody who's been here all my life, it's, it's been at least 20 or 30 years of trying to turn the town in, actually probably closer to 40 years of trying to turn the town inside out. You know, basically taking the businesses and you take put them on the outside and the plan, the reason for the neglect in downtown, it's been 20 something years of trying to force apartments down there and build density. And I don't really hear a lot right now that really varies from that plan. I mean, and it just, it's just, it seems like the same thing that I've heard over and over and over again in this room. You know, it's a, another plan to put apartments down there, and not. And I'm not averse to apartments. I've lived in apartments, um, but I think that downtown Riverside's an example where you build the attraction, and it demands the housing. You build something cool, and then people want to be there. That's the model we ought to we ought to follow. Not, you know, well, look, if we build enough houses, eventually somebody's going to figure out something cool down there. Then you end up with Metro at Maine, and that's not what anybody wants. You, you build a ton of housing and a strip mall, and I see that over and over again. It just if you have something cool, look, hey, Anaheim Stadium's cool. They're building some apartments next to Anaheim Stadium. That's a cool place to live. But you have Anaheim Stadium. You have a cool thing that you built. Um, you know that you really have to think about building the cool thing first, then you know building the housing and just assuming something's going to pop up. I mean, I, I mean, the old city manager was always this way about, oh yeah, well, it's highest and best use. We got to get rid of that tire store. You know, the guys at the tire store eat. There's no place to eat down there. We build some cool place to eat. The guys at the tire store and the people from the hospital will both go down there and eat. You know, you got to build the cool stuff down there. Build some restaurants. Do you know? Make it facilitate that. Um, I'm curious on the uh, the creepy data. Seem to show that nobody goes to Skyline. It's odd. It didn't even make the list. Any of the lists, um, which causes me to be suspect of how accurate the creepy data is. Um, you know, it seems like nobody from downtown. Seems like a lot. I, I think a lot of people come from downtown to go to Skyline. Not even a destination from people from the outside, apparently, by this list. Um, and the sales tax revenue is not 37% from 17 and 18. As we heard just a few weeks ago, it's going to be 50% or thereon. It's going to be 46 or something percent. So you may have heard that we've had that we're basically doubling the sales tax share. Um, and also that the creepy data is largely from during the lockdown. And that you, to think that that's a representative sample of what people were doing to say that that's where people have been at. You look at the date, it was uh, 520 to 421. I can't think of a region that's going to be more upside down entirely during the lockdown and say, well, this is what people do. That's not what people are doing. So thank you very much. Ms. Edwards, any other speaker cards or written comments? Mayor, no, we do not. Okay. With that, we'd like to thank Cosmo uh, Companies and Storyland Studios very much for the presentation. And uh, Ms. Gonzalez, for your leadership and your team as well for your participation in this. We're, I'm glad we ended on this one. Um, with that, our next meeting is the City Council meeting on Wednesday, July 7th, here at City Hall at 6.30. And this meeting is adjourned.